Yeah. But we should be able to move that on camera. All right, it's doing something new. Great, thank you everyone for your um, patience here this evening at the March 20th, uh, 2024 Environmental Quality Commission meeting. Uh, I'll turn it now over to Chair Headley. Thank you. Uh, welcome everyone to the March 20th, 2024 Environmental Quality Commission meeting. This is an in-person and virtual meeting uh, with EQC members, city staff, and members of the public. Uh, so for the roll call, uh, I'd like to introduce staff and EQC members present. Um, in the room, we have um, myself, Vice Chair Schmidt, uh, Commissioner, Commissioners Lynn McKenna and Polly Grigio part. Um, Commissioner Kissel, Commissioner Kissel is expected to arrive anytime now. And staff present include our new sustainability manager, Rachel Wander. Welcome. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Ori um, Paz, Jillian Keller, and Joanna Chen. Thank you all for being here. And we also have three members of the public joining um, in the room. And we also have, a, I think, let's see, we have a number of participants participating online as well. So welcome to all of you. Um, Mr. Paz, would you please provide instructions to the commission and members of the public on how the meeting will proceed? Certainly. Thank, Thank you, Chair Headley. Uh, for members of the public who are in attendance and wish to provide public comment on any item after the chair calls for public comment on the item you wish to speak, um, please fill out a um, comment card and you can just flag any, uh, well, any, either of us down and we can uh, provide you with the comment cards. And then for members of the public who are in attendance, um, remotely. Um, if you'd like to speak uh, on any item, please engage the raised hand feature. Um, and if you're joining by a phone, please press star nine to raise your virtual hand. Um, and then we can uh, go ahead and um, engage your microphone uh, and allow you to provide public comment on, on those items. And we'll go over these instructions again for, for every item. Um, so you're not. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I return the meeting to the chair. All right. So we are on item C, which is public comment. And this is the opportunity to address the commission on any subjects not listed on the agenda. So if you're here about the heritage tree appeal or about building decarbonization or anything else that's listed on the agenda, we should save that. But any other topics, we can hear from you now for a period of three minutes. Great. Oh, would you call for public comment, please? Uh, certainly. Uh, so now I'll call for public comment. Uh, any um, Anyone who's with us in person who'd like to give public comment, um, please activate your your raised hand feature, or if you're joining oh. remotely or virtually, um, please engage the raised hand feature on Zoom um, or press star nine uh, if you're joining by phone um, to, to raise your hand. We can give it one more moment. At this time, I'm not seeing any raised hands virtually or in person. Uh, so I can return it to you, Chair Headley. Thank you, Mr. Paz. So we're on to um, item D, regular business. And D1 is to approve the February 21st, 2024 Environmental Quality Commission meeting minutes. And there was an attachment that was sent out with the, the notes for this meeting tonight. Are there any uh, clarifying questions from the EQC before taking public comment? All right, Mr. Paz, do we have any public comment on this item? Okay, so again, if you'd like to provide public comment on this item, please engage your raised hand or press star nine if you're joining by phone. I don't see any raised hands in person or online. And so I can return to you, Chair Hensley, to go public comment. Thank you. And now the floor is open for any EQC discussion, or we can move to a motion if anyone has one. Okay. 
Okay. okay. Is there a motion? Oh, well, can I, can we just add like quick updates or on something we cover or is that not in bounds? Um, these are, these are, would be minutes. Related to one of the presentations in the minutes from last time or is it? Was there something that was inaccurate? Uh, something that happened after the presentation last month, mm -hmm. just as an update to the group. Yeah. Um, so we, through the chair, we could do that as a report in the reports and announcements oh, right. um, great. Great. at yeah. the end of, okay. or yeah. towards the end of the meeting. Yeah. Okay. yeah, that sounds good. Great. All right. So um, do I have a motion in a second for this agenda item? Thank you, Commissioner yeah. McKenna. And I'll second. Seconded. Thank you, Commissioner Poligrio Part. Commissioner Kissel is here. Welcome. If you could make a note about that as well. So no. And you're just in time for the first one. Okay. Um, Mr. Paz, would you please state the motion? Uh, so we have a motion by Commissioner McKenna and a second by Commissioner Pellegrino Part to uh, approve the uh, meeting minutes from the February. 21st uh, meeting. All those in favor? Yes. And I'm going to abstain. Okay. So we, um, for the record, we have five commissioners voting in the affirmative and one abstention by Chair Headley. Thank you. All right. So we're moving on to agenda item D2, which is to consider the appeal that has come forward in light of staff's decision to approve the removal of a heritage tree. Um, just as context setting, um, what we can do as EQC is, is either deny the appeal and uphold staff's decision to approve the removal of the tree, or we can deny the heritage tree removal. And in making this determination, we can only consider um, alternatives and concepts and third party expert evidence submitted to the city during the review period, which I think staff is gonna take us through so that we can make a decision. Um, and I believe we have a presentation by city staff, maybe? Yes, we do. And give me just one moment and I will present the present, well, I'll put the presentation on the Thank you. screen and then turn it over to both of us. Um, and maybe while Mr. Paz is getting that settled, I know often when we have a presentation from staff, there's often questions, uh, but I would like the commissioners to hold their questions until the end because it's likely that your question will be answer in the presentation. Okay. Great. So I uh, have the um, presentation up and I'll turn it over to Sure. I think it okay. Great. So I can explain how I evaluated the tree and its suitability for preservation given the proposed construction, explain why I made the decision I made. Um, maybe Joanna, you can help me out and talk a bit about um, the alternatives to removal that were presented, since I'm a little less familiar with those. And then we can take questions afterwards. Great. All right, great. So um, this is my, my first time being involved with an appeal that's being discussed at an EQC meeting. So this is, this is new for me? It's true for all of us. Okay. Yes. This is the first appeal under the new Heritage Tree Ordinance. So we'll, we're all with you. Okay, great. I, I appreciate that. I'm a little nervous, but. So as many of you might know, um, unfortunately, there are a lot of impacts from construction that can adversely impact trees. For example, roots can be damaged or removed during excavation activities, during grading, during excavation for piers for a, a new uh, pergola or piers for a, a two-story house with a basement. That involves a lot of excavation. They need a lot of room to perform that work. And oftentimes we'll try to preserve trees around the perimeter of the property. 
sometimes not with the most success. Unfortunately, there are often roots that are growing in those areas that need to be excavated where the new piers and foundation or the new basement is going. Um, I think it's a common misconception that root systems are very deep and contained to the area below the drip line of the tree. Um, like native oaks like valley oaks and coast live oaks, especially when they're mature, have very extensive root systems. Like breadwoods have very shallow root systems with roots that often will spread one and a half to two times outside of the drip line of the tree. Um, so they're often unfortunately impacted by construction, even, even if it's on the other side of the property. Um, there's also the impact of soil compaction. Um, so during construction, they'll often need to compact the soil and like grade it to a specific level. Um, and that soil compaction is often associated with like paving, like new walkways or new patios. Of course, they need a like stable base to lay down their, their concrete, but compacting the soil and paving over it oftentimes will um, interfere with the root system's ability to exchange oxygen with the atmosphere. And it also interferes with uh, the root's ability to take up water as well because Oftentimes those surfaces are not permeable. Um, there's also potential for injury to the trunk and the crown of the tree. Sometimes these construction sites will have like big machinery come in. And we do try to encourage developers to establish tree protection zones with chain fencing. Sometimes they have to work really close to the trees and they'll take down the fencing, which is not advisable, but it still happens. And then we require that they have trunk protection. But sometimes the construction contractor just go wild and play bumper cars with the trees, with their construction equipment. So unfortunately, we do have um, damage to trunk, to branches. Heat damage is also something. Um, if you have like a bobcat on site and it's like um, the exhaust from the bobcat can... Um, scorch the, the foliage of the trees. Like we had some like recently planted um, red buds on Willow Road street trees. And like, there were just so many construction vehicles stopping at this one stop sign that the leaves of the trees were burned from the exhaust from the vehicles, which was crazy. Cause it's not like an active construction site. It was just a busy intersection where you have a lot of cars but that obviously can damage the, the foliage and lead to stress and impacts chemical damage, like when they um, use solvents, paint thinners, fuel. Um, sometimes people accidentally spill those onto the soil, those can impact trees. Um, there's also like potential um, for trunk flare or root collar damage that's damaged to like the base of the tree um, when they like sometimes store equipment or just pile soil up against the base of the tree. Um, so the tree isn't accustomed to having the soil at that level. So it can interfere again with the tree's ability to like get oxygen from the air through its roots. Um, it can also lead to um, like suffocating of the roots and excess accumulation of moisture, which can lead to decay and rot in the tree. And um, it also can create decay that is more susceptible to insect pests, infestation and damage, um, root disease, and it can also lead to like root issues as well. Like when roots like grow up and start girdling one another and girdling the trunk. Um, so that's just like an overview of the, the many unfortunate impacts that trees sometimes can be subjected to during construction. Um, I think we can move on to the next slide. So I love trees. I just want to start off right there. Um, I love wildlife. Um, I think that was a concern of the appealing party, like Native coast live oaks and valley oaks are some of my favorite trees. Um, I'm also like a really passionate birder. Like my boyfriend is a wildlife biologist. We'll go out and we'll like look for animals on the weekends. Um, you know, over at his house, we've planted a lot of native ceanothus and toya. We set up bird feeders and bird houses. Like I love birds. I love trees. I 
as city arborists, we want to do my best to preserve trees and preserve wildlife habitat. Um, like earlier this week, I had a, a really um, exciting success. There were two dying locust trees on a church property that were proposed for removal. And when I arrived on site, I noticed that they were being utilized as granary trees for a family of acorn woodpeckers. Mm. Um, and I, I, I even saw two woodpeckers on the trees and it was so cool. So I, I managed to talk the church into preserving those trees as wildlife snacks. So I, I love those kinds of opportunities. Um, with all of that being said, though, um, I, I still am the city arborist and it is my responsibility to uphold and objectively, consistently, and fairly enforce our heritage tree ordinance um, using you know, best management practices for arboriculture. So this is a, a screenshot from one of my best management practices for managing trees for construction books. Um, and using these guidelines, city arborists and private arborist consultants who work on project arborists are able to determine just how severely a tree might be impacted by proposed construction um, based on a number of different factors. So we can walk through this together. This is part of how I evaluated how suitable the tree was for preservation. Um, so you can start with species tolerance to construction damage on the far left. Um, Coast live oak, which is a species of the tree in question, is uh, remarkably tolerant of, of root damage and construction, which, which is awesome. Um, the tree is also young. It's, it's young, it's vigorous, it's very healthy. Um, so based on that, we have a TPZ, a tree protection zone multiplication factor of six. So that means you take the trunk diameter of the tree, which in this case is 10 inches, multiply that by six. Let me pull out my calculator really quick because I'm not very good at math. Six uh, times 10 is 60. So 60 inches divided by 12 equals five. Five feet. Um, that is how far away we want to keep construction impacts and root loss in particular away from the, the trunk of this tree. Um, so keep that in mind. Let's go on to the next page. Oh, it's a little hard to read. I'm sorry. So this is another um, worksheet that you can use to determine um, how suitable a tree is for preservation on an active construction site. So I've circled the, the root cut fill distance from trunk right here. And it's the amount of distance you want to maintain from a tree is based on its trunk diameter as a general rule. So the foundation for the new garage in this case is planned three feet away from the trunk of the tree. So the tree has an, a trunk diameter of 10 inches. So that means that the root cut fill distance from the tree is going to be, um, yeah, what is it? It's going to be, it's going to be really close. I can't even read it like being this close. Okay, but right here, if less than five, oops. Is that helpful? No. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, so there's a little bullet point here associated with this row. So it says, if less than five, generally this tree would not be a good candidate for, for preservation. So five is right here. So five is six inches away, so six to 12 inches away per one inch trunk diameter. So we have a 10 inch tree, which means ideally we'd, we'd want to be at least 10 feet away, but we're going to be three feet away, which puts us in this, you know, danger zone right here. Um, the root cut fill distance is, is too close um, in this case. Uh, next slide. 
Okay, so this was an unfortunate instance. Um, so this is a different construction project in Menlo Park. Um, same species, coastline oak. Um, I was really hoping to work with the construction contractor and the developer to retain this beautiful native coast live oak that was otherwise perfectly healthy and structurally sound. Um, that being said, they did have like huge heavy machinery on site to excavate and install the caves at the unit. So this is gonna be a new two-story house with the basement. You see just how extensive these impacts are. They basically just tear up the whole site. Um, and right here, you can see that they've impacted roots. Um, so during the November holiday, we had some storms come through last year and like I got some frantic calls about how like the tree was swaying in the wind, how like the root system was destabilized and how it seemed like it was going to topple over and land on the neighbor's house, unfortunately. Um, so we did end up issuing an emergency removal permit. Um, I just wanted to mention this unfortunate incident because it, it does show like if you do like excavate within the tree's critical root zone, like this was literally just like two and a half maybe feet away from the top of the tree, there is the potential um, to adversely impact the tree's root system to increase the imminent likelihood of the tree uprooting and failing, um, not to mention not only the loss of those structural roots, but the loss of feeder roots too, which um, help feed the tree as the name suggests. So too much of those roots loss can <clears throat> impact the tree's health and viability long-term, unfortunately. So, you know, using the industry's best management practices for managing trees during construction and figuring out whether or not a tree is a good candidate for preservation given the scope of work and given my past experience with projects like this, I, I determined that I could approve the tree for removal because again, the foundation for the garage is literally just three feet away from the trunk of the tree. The trunk is also located where they plan on paving. Um, there's also that issue as well. And um, as a part of Menlo Park's heritage tree removal permit application process, we do require like a study of alternative designs that would enable the preservation of the tree to see how feasible those are. So the applicant did provide an alternative design. I think it was instead of using like a continuous slab foundation, for the garage, which is typically what you use. Um, so it's just like, you know, continuous excavation, like more root impacts. They explored the potential to instead just drill piers. So it's not continuous, it's gonna be less root impacts. That could potentially enable the preservation of the tree, um, especially if they worked with the project arborist. Um, if they were on site and they were like, hey, can you shift the pier a little bit over to the left or like one foot that way, we can like work around some of these larger structural roots that could be possible, but they provided a cost estimate for that alternative design and showed that it was more than 140% the appraised value of the tree, um, which according to Menlo Park's ordinance, um, it is considered financially infeasible for implementing that alternative design to preserve the tree. So since it like, it wasn't very feasible to preserve the tree based on the proximity of impactful construction. And they had an alternative desired cost analysis that showed that it was financially feasible to preserve the tree. And they also uh, proposed a tree replacement plan that met the city's requirements. They, they just ticked all the boxes, like, and I approved it. Um, you know, it, I try to remove myself emotionally from from my work because like, I am always sad to see native oaks be removed. Um, but I, you know, they went through the process and they met the city's requirements. They are planning on planting a new 
native coast live oak on the side, 24 inch box. Um, so I know it's not quite the same. It'll take, you know, like 10 years, 15 years before it would reach the, the size of the tree that's going to be removed. Um, but that's really like as much as I can require as a, as a city arborist. Thank you for that mm -hmm. presentation. Um, Ms. Chen, was there anything else you wanted to add? All right, um, so now we can take clarifying questions from the EQC, and then we'll move to public comment. So are there any clarifying questions? Can, can you remind us the constraints over which we are supposed to have this conversation? Um, you told us at the beginning. Yeah, so we get to, um, our, our role today is to either deny the appeal and uphold um, mm -hmm. Ms. Keller's decision to approve the removal of this tree, or we can deny the heritage tree removal permit. But so, to, to do that, oh, we can... We can only consider um, removal alternatives and concepts and third-party expert evidence that was submitted to the city during the review period, which I think would be, is included in the staff report that was part of the agenda. Um, yeah. Okay. Any additional clarifying questions? Okay. So, um, Seeing none, let's move to um, public comment. Mr. Claus, would you call for public comment? Um, so what, what, I just wanted to make sure that, um, was there a presentation from the permit applicant or the? Um, I think they have one, right, Joanna? So permit applicant, they wanted to share their revised landscape uh, design. Okay, so we, um, Great. just a, yeah, point of. Are they the same thing? Yes. Okay. Okay, and great. So I think it's it, um, Janice. Okay, I can allow you to talk. Hi, hi, Janice. Are you the permit applicant? Yes, we are the architects. Okay. Oh, great. Um, so I'll go ahead and um, uh, put your slide on the screen. Bear with me one moment. Is that, is that, um, saved in here. Okay. Glenn, do you have that? Oh, okay. Thank you. Always make it the action and share the screen. Oh, yeah. Um, we should we should do the the screen sharing, but I will bring up the agenda, um, and we can share from there. Thanks everybody for your patience. Oh, looks like oh, okay, great. I'm seeing like architectural drawings on page 35 and 36. Oh, yeah. um, I'm not sure if that's what they want us to show. Um, there's also page 45, maybe is a full color version that might be what. Yeah. 45, 47, 48. Okay. I have it now. Janice, as we pull it up, let us know if we're on the right page. Okay, yeah. Is it going to show up on that big screen? Um, that wooden big screen? Yeah, that's the intent. We're just taking a minute to get there. Okay. Okay, so. If you zoom out, maybe that will help. Oh, okay, here we are. 
we're just a little bit off. So maybe if we close the tools and we'll have yeah. more space. We're going to go full screen mode while we're in the um... Oh, here we go. This is the one. Yep. Thank you. OK, so we look forward to hearing you walk through. OK, great. This. Um, hi, my name is Janice Chu. Uh, good evening. I'm the architect with 360 Design Studio. Um, thank you for your time tonight. Um, we are the architects hired by the owner to design a new two-story single-family home on 219 Durham Street. And we would like to propose to remove a 10-inch diameter coastal oak tree, number as T2 on the Arbor's report. We understand the significance of protecting native species. So during design phase, we have explored many options for keeping it. However, after much consideration and consultation with professionals, we decided it's appropriate to re remove the tree. Um, to mitigate the loss of this tree, we propose the following. We will plant a 24 inch box native California oak as a replacement tree at the southeast corner of the lot. And a 36 box, 36 inch box marina strawberry tree as a replacement tree in the front yard. And we also want to address our neighbors' concerns on privacy by adding three more screening trees at the side yard. So there will be a total of five screening trees at the side yard. Just want to make sure we're looking at the right spot. Um, so if you the bottom left then, corner, yeah, there. the bottom left corner, does that which is the southeast corner, oh. is, the, is the replacement okay. tree, which is a native California oak tree. Okay. And then if you look at the front yard, do you see the water feature in the front? Correct. Yes. And then that big tree, a multi-trunk tree, is a marina strawberry tree, which is also a replacement tree. Mm. And then if you look at the right side of the property, which is a property line sharing with the neighbor, Mm -hmm. Correct, yeah. So originally we only have two screening trees, but because the neighbor was concerned if this oak tree is being removed, she's concerned about privacy. So we would like to propose adding three more screening trees to provide more privacy. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I'd like to clarify something just for everybody. Um, this is where the oak being proposed for removal is located, right there. Okay. And they are planning on planting some his forum screening shrubs, which are evergreen, pretty dense, fast growing. Okay. Okay, Janice, did you have anything else to add? Um, I also want to add that we, when I say we have explored many options for keeping this oak tree, uh, we also have to think about the safety. Uh, we have talked to the arborists on um, this tree here, and he was saying um, because the tree is only three feet away from the tree, um, the tree is just way too close for optimal tree development. And since this is a two-story home and the tree is so close to the structure, so with ongoing pruning, the canopy can become lopsided and the tree can, you know, the tree could become unbalanced and has a likelihood of failure during storm seasons. And besides, uh, for the safety reason, we also think about the design functionality um, because there's a big oak tree in the back here, which is measured 20.5 inch diameters, we are also trying to save. Um, we even designed a house around it to create a courtyard to celebrate this tree. If we were to save both trees, 
um, we will lose the whole, uh, a lot of this front facade to fit in the garage, the entry and the living room with a design, with a decent windows. So there's a design function functionality issues because this is a very narrow, it's a narrow lot. It's only 50 feet wide. If we minus the side yard and minus the extra seven feet from the tree, we really left very little length for the front facade to design this house to become functional. So based on the safety issues, based on the financial considerations, which is the piers can be much more expensive, and also based on the safety, these three reasons, we think that it's, it's appropriate to remove to remove this tree. Um, I think that's conclude my presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Janice. Okay, are there any other um, presentations that we are expecting? Or should we move to public comment? Oh, uh, well, for a moment, just to confirm, there's no no appellant. I, I feel like you're here. Oh, here. Yeah, but I didn't know. Well, I'm the public, so I'm not not the appellant. Is the appellant? Well, I am. An, I'm appealing, but I am the public. Oh, so see, we're that the same. Mm -hmm. I'm Kathy. Oh, okay. Yes, she is the appellant. So the appellant um, participated. Okay. okay. Great, great, good. Great. So, uh, um, I'm Kathy Crane, and I live at 227 Durham Street, next door to this tree, and I'm speaking on behalf of not removing the large Quercus agrifolia that's being discussed today. Um, I do have quite a bit of experience in the plant world. I've owned um, Yerba Buena, California native plant nursery, for 25 years, and I make it my mission to advocate for the use of native plants, for their value in for wildlife and people. And it's extremely important that we preserve and plant more natives instead of removing them. Um, I've just heard the architect mention that they're going to, to put in some landscaping um, only one of the plants that they're putting in is native, and that's the oak tree that they're gonna put on the opposite side of the property from the one that they propose taking down. All of the other plants are not native. There's not a single one. The hedges aren't native. The strawberry tree is not native. It's really not, doesn't make up for the removal of a heritage native tree, in my opinion. Um, and as our arborist mentioned, this native tree is a home and food source for birds. And I observe this every day when I go in my backyard. This is my backyard, not my side. Yard. I see um, birds and animals there. Um, I provide water for them. And I purposely have not planted under the oak tree because I know that you shouldn't put plants that need water there that might disturb its roots. So there's plenty of space on my side of the fence that's undisturbed for the roots of this tree, which is literally on the property line. Um, I have no issue with my neighbors building a house. I, they're very nice people. I want them to have a lovely place to live, but I don't think it should be at, at the expense of, of the tree. Um, I'm halfway through. <laughs> so I just want to say that um, another point that the arborist made was about how trees can get sick from all of this uh, construction, but oaks actually secrete a substance that's similar to nectar that helps protect the tree from harmful insects and pests. And oaks are extremely resilient at having negative impacts occur to them and coming back from it. So this tree has a good chance of being able to survive what's being thrown at it as long as people aren't dumping turpentine at the roots or purposely trying to kill it. I think it has a chance. So um, just in conclusion, I don't think that you can value a tree even though it's been valued here at I think $1,800 this 
30 foot tree, which is ridiculous. Um, you can't compensate for the loss of habitat shade and privacy, at least in my lifetime. And um, I grew up in Menlo Oaks, where there are oak trees in the middle of the street, on the sides of the street, and on property lines everywhere that are doing just fine next to pavement and development. And I'd like this tree to have a chance. So thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So I think now that we've heard the three different presentations, maybe this is, I know I have questions. Um, maybe some questions from the EQC and then from the public, or do we pass the EQC question? So if there are clarifying questions, we can take clarifying questions now, Other, but if it's part of the discussion, then um, we should take public comment and then. I have a clarifying uh, question. Okay. Um, so this might be for uh, Janice, and it is, is it, and maybe for Jillian too, is it possible to do the construction that's planned while leaving the tree intact and giving it a chance? Um, I, I can answer that first, um, and then maybe Janice can can weigh in. So looking at the, the landscape plan, which also has the site plan on it, I think it is possible if they install the pier foundation that will reduce the severity of the impacts. Um, the tree, as I mentioned, is also located where they're planning on installing concrete slab walkway. So if they like remove, if they leave like ideally like at least five feet of space around the trunk, like just remove one of those concrete slabs um, like up there, they can meander that walkway around the trunk of the tree, like remove one of those concrete slabs because it looks like I don't know, it's kind of like square slabs. Um, that would um, you know, reduce the severity of impacts and you wouldn't have paving right up against the trunk of the tree. Um, and like the, the appellant mentioned, um, the species coast live oak, especially when the trees are really young, when they're really vigorous and healthy, they are amazingly resilient to root impacts. Um, that being said, like still, it'll it'll be a little close. The foundation for the ground will be a little close, um, which is which is concerning. But you know, if they have the the pier foundation, if they have a project arborist on site helping to guide the root pruning and helping them preserve as many roots as possible, you know, they change the walkway design, um, and they just maybe have an arborist come out like every year to check on the tree, see if there are any like signs of instability, if there aren't any other like impacts to the tree, like it's it's possible. Yeah, I, possible. Thank you. Uh-huh. Um, let's give Janice a chance to yeah. respond. Janice, do you concur with um, what Ms. Keller just shared? If you're still with us. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Well, I understand um, I understand that the tree could survive, but functional wise, it will over time the tree will grow and it will get bigger, the trunk will get bigger, it will damage the concrete, it will become very hard for the owner to walk through that concrete pathway. Um that is you know, on one floor is the design functionality um, issues. The second thing is, again, is the safety. The tree will continue to grow. And we have approached our arborists multiple times about this tree. And we study the height of this tree. It's a two-story house. And being so close to the tree, the tree canopies cannot grow like 360 degree. It will have to be trimmed on one side so that it can it won't clash onto the second floor, uh, the second floor volume. So the tree will be lopsided. I mean the canopy is not balanced. And over time the tree is not balanced and will be become a hazard in the future. Um, that is based on what the harborist said to us. 
Okay, thank you. Um, any other EQC clarifying questions? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I hope this is a clarifying question. Is uh, I'm not sure I understand the dynamic between the planning permissions and the heritage tree ordinance because what, what I'm taking away is if they if an owner follows the rules of the ordinance um, the development always kind of wins like your flexibility you, you have to follow the rules and development wins because so so I don't I'm trying to get a sense of we're not debating it sounds like we can't debate whether they have to go back and redesign. That's not what we're discussing. We don't have any influence over that. Am I interpreting that right? Because because I think what a lot of us who love trees would want to do is say, like, can there be some kind of a redesign? But uh, I don't think we have influence. And so I'm trying to clarify where the the authority to go back and propose that. It's It's just unclear. Sure. So through the chair, I'd just like to kind of go back to the original parameters that the chair shared through. Um, and so those are from the Heritage Tree Ordinance. And so this was something that was developed um, with a lot of uh, public engagement um, over, over multiple years. Um, and so that, that process outlines the requirements that the um, project teams need to to follow to preserve trees, and if if there is an instance where a tree is proposed for removal, the process um, to evaluate those trees that the city arborist um, follows, and then the the replacement guidelines. So with that, it, the commission is limited in in its purview to the the items outlined by the chair, which we could repeat if helpful. Yeah, and the applicant did evaluate, as I understand it, a few different options to retain the tree, but it was not cost. Um, it didn't make sense financially, according to the heritage tree ordinance that we have in place. Got it. Okay. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. So we, we have no, yeah, there's well, no debate or discussion about the, the design itself. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so I, I have questions, but I don't know, <laughs> given the constraints, I don't know exactly what they're If they're not clarifying questions, why don't we go to public comment and then we can have well, a um, discussion. I, I guess clarifying here, how old is the tree? Um, that's a great question. It can be hard to determine how old the tree is because site constraints can result in the tree growing faster or slower. Um, yeah, I looked at the tree a couple months ago, so I'm trying to remember. Maybe like 20, 25, or do you have do you have an estimate? You have a lot of you like to mention what the size of the tree is too, not just the diameter. It's about 30 feet tall and about 25 to 30 feet wide on the canopy. And it can be pruned on the inside. It has a if you look underneath it, it doesn't form a complete circle. It has a main trunk and a side branch that would go parallel with the construction. So it could, it, in my opinion, it could be pruned, but I am not an arborist. I'm a nursery person, nurseryman. I don't have any more within the constraints at all. Thank you. Um, so if there's no other uh, clarifying questions from the EPC, let us move to public comment. Um, Ms. Mr. Paz, would you call for public comment? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Chair Headley. So at this time, I'd like to call for public comment on, uh, on this item. If anyone um, in attendance has public comment, please raise your hand, or if you're joining um, uh, virtually, uh, please activate your uh, raise hand feature or press um, star nine if you're joining by phone. I do see one um, person and then um, 
Janice, are you are you wanting to provide public comment as well, or is uh, your hand up just from earlier? I just want to add one more point, if time allowed. Um, so at, at this time, we're going to take public comment, and then there's um, we're going to move into the the commissioner discussion uh, through the chair, unless Janice, your your comment is um, in clarification on the the last clarifying question of the age of the tree. I think we would move to public comment. Well, we don't know the age of the tree, but we are just following the the code, the city code um, for the 10 inches uh, requirement. And I just want to um, mention that when we start designing, it was measured as 9.5 inches. That's why we thought it's not protected, but by the time we submit, it grew to become 10 inches. So that's what I want to um, add to it. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Public comment time? Yes, and we do have one uh, member of the public uh, online with the raise hand. So I'll, I will um, activate Beeman. Um, Beam, are you able to unmute and, and share your yes. public comment? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I'm uh hi, my name is Beam. I am the owner of 219 Durham Street. Um so just wanted to clarify in terms of the question on the age of the tree. I don't know the exact age of the tree, but I moved in here in 2016 and it was part of a hedge and we kind of removed all the foliage around it and we saw this tree was was growing well and we kind of preserved it um but at the time it was a few feet tall it wasn't it wasn't too big so um i wouldn't put the age too much past high single digits um and the only other thing i'd say is that um if you look at the design we we you know Kathy's been an amazing neighbor and she's she's helped design our front yard of our existing property and we appreciate trees and nature as well. And we one of the things that I had told the 360 design was to make sure that the large oak, that whatever we build is designed around the large oak tree. It's a very healthy tree, it's a nice tree. And um we currently have three trees on the property. And if you see the landscape plan, it's got a whole lot more than three. Um, I understand not a lot are natives. Um, so we're trying to replace one with the other. The reason it's on the other side of the property versus where the existing oak is, is just that there's no obstruction. Um, so we figured we'd kind of remain in balance by at least somewhat make make an effort to remain in balance by replanting a tree that we're taking away and and let it grow and thrive for years to come. Thank you, Bean. Okay. Um, I, if there's anyone else who has a public comment on this item, please uh, activate your raised hand feature or uh, press star nine. Um, I'm not seeing any any others. I uh, return to you, Chair, to close phone call. Okay, thank you. So now um, the floor is open for EQC discussion. I have a question. Um, you had asked if there was a way to see if the tree could be given a chance, and you had said only if they did the pier foundation. If they did a slab, the tree has no chance, or very little chance. Right. Like, are you saying that for the tree to have at least a chance, they would need to do this pier type of foundation? Um. So it's it's really hard to say that definitively without knowing exactly where the tree roots are located and how large they are. Like having a pier foundation would definitely reduce impacts, and I'd be more comfortable retaining the tree there because less of that earth would be. Um, excavated there would be less root loss um i i can't say with certainty that it would be possible to preserve the tree with the foundation currently 
planned as it is, um, it's it's possible, but it would really depend on how many roots are growing in that area. I think that area right now, it's just landscaping, right? There's no pavement. Okay. So you would have roots there. If they did still have like a project arborist working with them on site, like it's it's possible, but I I would I would hesitate to if I was a private arborist, like recommend that the tree be preserved with that scope of work. Um but at the very least, they should definitely redesign that concrete walkway around the trunk of the tree. Because that you can't preserve a tree when you're planning on just paving the whole area where it's trunk and root system are located. And the pure uh, foundation was listed as the alternative design number one I believe in so, the packet, yeah. right? And it shows an incremental cost of $10,800. Right. Okay. Yeah, and I think that that's more than the tree's appraised value. Yeah, which was appraised at eighteen hundred dollars. Yeah. Okay. Um, but that is an alternative. Okay. Um, Vice Chair Schmidt, over to you. Yeah, I, I'm. Uh, <laughs> I'm still struggling with the. Um, sorry, struggling to probably the wrong word. I, I think. It sounds like they've followed all the code. The financial impacts are there. So they're going to go. I'm trying to make sure I understand that what you're recommending to give the tree a chance, those have been pushed out of bounds essentially because of the financial impact. Like there's no guarantee that if we said, well, Jillian, we all want to give it a chance. There's no guarantee that the development will actually do that because the financial impacts have kind of disqualified it. Am I understanding it right? Or yes, you are. Okay. Um, and my decision making ability with regards to these heritage tree removal permit applications is limited to what is outlined in the municipal code and our heritage tree ordinance. Okay. I wish it wasn't the case. Right, right. Um, I wish I had a little bit more flexibility sometimes, but. Yes, you are correct. And and so just and we're so we're we're not able to push back on the design because that stuff's already been done, right? And there's been lots of negotiation and lots of options. So we are kind of where we are. You've done everything you're mandated to do. And so that's the decision point. Is that yes, that's okay. fine. Sure. Okay. That's not <laughs> Let's go here, here, and yeah, yeah. So I, just for clarification, I mean, this is between legislation and judicial, right? And so we don't have judicial standing. If we want to change it for the future, then we have to be legislation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Which might be something that comes out of this right. conversation. But I don't, I don't think, or, 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 if I'm understanding correctly, you don't have the authority to go over this decision. Oh, um, actually, we can. Like, it comes here, and we can decide either do we uphold, you know, the do we... Uh, uphold the decision the arborists make right. or do we deny the heritage tree application and then it would go either to the planning commission or city council we right. can decide either way but we might decide one way that we don't love and also decide we want to look at the so ordinance you, could you say the hospital one more time that, that it would go back to the city council and the planning commission well it goes different places depending on what we decide and that is listed it's complicated so i would want to read it it's listed in the uh the staff report yeah yeah but i Okay. Yeah. So would it be helpful to pull up the staff report yeah. that actually has the, like, <laughs> the I'm reading blurb. it here? The blurb might be helpful for sure. For us sure. To um, yeah, and I sorry, I can interject. Um, Joanna Chan, management analyst for Public Works. Um, so while Ori is pulling up the staff report to, to provide language, um, so I guess a simpler way of looking at this is EQC commissioners have two choices. It's one is to uphold the city staff decision. Um, and the other one is to uphold the appellant's um, um, appeal, which was to preserve the tree due to, you know, the other alternative that was proposed is to trim the canopy. Um, so it's either you preserve the tree to prune the canopy or to remove the tree based on development. There, there wouldn't be able, but like you had mentioned, um, you can't really change the design of it uh, because that wasn't what it was proposed. Okay. Can, can I ask a quick question here? 
So um, I understand our options. I understand the, the information we can based on. I don't understand the criteria we can use. So we hear all of these and then what can, just our gut feeling or, or I mean, what, what, what do we use to yeah. do this? This thing? is what we discussed. Yeah. Corey, it's page nine. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Ms. Chen. <laughs> okay, so what I'm reading here and or we will get to it, yeah. So if the EQC approves the heritage tree removal, um, the approval should be is, is conditioned upon final approval of the project by the planning commission or city council as applicable. Um, and then it goes on. If the EQC denies the heritage tree removal, saying we want to keep the tree in the ground, the permit applicant, BEAM, can appeal the decision to the city council before planning commission review within 15 days of our decision. So we can decide either way, and then both parties have a chance to take the next step if they want to. And we can use any criteria we may want to make that decision. I think so. Yeah. Then can I ask a question from the art first on this? Um, what's the impact of removing or not removing the tree on the other tree? So we have two trees. One is a, a, a big, old, very um, healthy tree. Well, a big tree, big tree and a small tree. What's the impact on the big tree of leaving little tree there or removing the tree, little tree? Okay, so I don't know if you can bring up the the plans There's or forty eight. I, I live relatively close to the place, so I actually drove there yesterday, and I I, I know the, the space, so you can go to the diagram. Great. Right. Um, so if you drove by, you might have seen that, man, and it's been, I should have driven by today to refresh my memory, because it has been a while since I was Yeah, it's, it's roughly where, I mean, it, it's there, so the canopies are pretty close to each other. Yeah. So right, 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 right. Pretty, right. pretty close together. Yeah, but I don't know how close the, the roots are. I don't know what happens if you yeah. remove the, the root for, for tree, for little tree, will mm -hmm. that impact the big tree? Uh, so if you leave little tree, will that impact big tree? Mm -hmm. Well, so, Julian collects her thoughts in the staff report. The um, applicant did submit uh, two alternative designs. So one of them was about drilling the piers, and the other one was about thinking about moving the um, garage back a little bit. Yeah. Um, but however, if they move the garage a little bit back, that would impact the health of the bigger tree. Yeah. And no, because it is bigger, uh, you know, it's it's choosing, you know. Which much impactful. Yeah, no, I, I understand. Yeah. 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 yeah, so my my, I don't know. Since it sounds like I can make my my vote anyway, then I'm just going to ask about that one. I mean, yeah. what what happens on big tree sure. depending on what we do to little tree. So um, this is a pretty large coast live oak. Like I mentioned, um, it probably has a pretty expansive root system. I wouldn't be surprised given the proximity of these two trees to one another. Um. That their root systems are intertwined. Mm -hmm. uh, their neighbors, their best buddies. Um, so if we did remove this smaller oak, um, and if they ground out the stump, it could have some impact to the root system of this oak. Um, this oak is also going to sustain impacts and root loss from the nearby construction deck as well. Um, I believe that this is also a concrete walkway that they're going to hopefully carefully construct around this tree to enable its preservation and long-term viability. Um, so it'll also experience root loss and changes in its root environment from construction, which I think would affect the tree more than the loss of this one, but it would still have an impact potentially on, on the root system of this tree. Um, so these trees have been growing together for a while. Um, I don't know what the predominant winds are in this area, um, but this tree is accustomed to having this tree next to it. It's accustomed to having this tree like block the wind, block the elements on this side. So um, if it is removed, this part of the tree will be more exposed. Um, the tree is not accustomed to having this side exposed, so it won't have like put on as much like stabilizing and strengthening wood 
on this part of the root system, on this side of the trunk, on this side of the crown, um, compared with if there was no oak next to it, um, and like this whole side was like exposed. Trees like experience their environment and react to it and like grow to like stabilize themselves against the elements, against the wind that experiences from that side. So there is that potential if, if, if there is like wind that usually comes through here, you know, removal of this oak would leave this part of the tree more exposed um, and would potentially like impact it adversely. Um, you know, like, I think it, it would be better for, you know, the health of this tree if this tree was left intact because they've grown together, they're accustomed to um, having one another by their side, like, protecting each other from the elements. Their root systems are probably intertwined, um, you know, but with all that being said, there is pretty, like, impactful construction plans all around here that will impact, like, both trees or just this one tree, whatever ends up being retained on site. Did that help answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other discussion? I just noticed I'm really torn. <laughs> you know, this is not easy. And I feel like the two neighbors, you know, I can sense the the respect and appreciation they have for each other and trying to do the right thing. And it sounds like the the applicant for the removal of the tree heard your concerns about the native tree and they swapped out their original plan to plant another oak. Um, so that, that gives me hope that there is, um, like, I, I guess I hope that you all will um, remain like good neighbors, you know, following this. and. Somehow that that dialogue gives me hope for um, your ongoing relationship and the ongoing relationship with nature, um, and the birds and all the other animals that um, you know that make these trees their their home. Um, I'm also appreciating how they offered to not just plant one tree, but like I think three or four additional ones to answer the screening question. So that I'm like, okay, I feel I, I feel like they're trying. Um, to kind of make things right. Um, but at the same time, it's, you know, it takes a long time to grow an old tree and this one is off to a good start. And, and to your point, it has a chance of making it. So I know I'm um, currently still kind of torn. It's not a clear answer. So I, I would love to hear from others um, how you're seeing this. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, same, like I appreciate everything uh, Chair Headley said, um, it's a tough decision. I, I respect the intentions and the concerns of all parties involved. Um, I've driven by the property as well. It's a beautiful tree. And it's a tough decision. It really is because, you know, you can't go back in time. It, it would have been great if there was just a design that preserved all three trees. Um, and I imagine there is a design that does that. Um, I understand that alternative designs have been explored and there's cost implications. And if the homeowner has to go back and redesign again, there's additional costs, but this is a tree that, um, you know, deserves a chance too. So yeah, I haven't made a decision yet, but um, I appreciate all the dialogue that we've had. Thank you, Commissioner McKenna. Because it does sound like the alternative number one with the pure foundation is possible for an extra $10,000. Any other comments? Yeah. Um, I just want to say a couple things as I'm debating it, like, like uh, Commissioner McKenna. Um, any decision is not a reflection on the reflection on Jillian and her decisions because I feel like this is a pretty eye opening to the kinds of constraints that she's under as the city arbor. So, um, yeah, it, it's I'm separate like you have to do for your personal um, care for nature. Uh, 
yeah, anything is it's about what what is in place in the city from an ordinance point of view that feels pretty uncomfortable and constrained. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of say that out loud because what I'm what I'm personally struggling with is sort of the same thing. Of, I never want to retreat, but uh, we we've got these ordinances that sort of force us in its hand. So anyway, I will stop rambling. Well, and we have an appeal process. You know, to have other concerns raised, which is where we're at. Right. Yeah. But we tried really hard, as I understand it, with the Heritage Tree Ordinance to clarify when trees can be removed and what the process is for um, making things whole again. And the applicant has followed all those rules, checked all the boxes. Yeah. Yeah. So it's an interesting situation. Different. Uh, Different what? It, it, different scenario. I think we we have a later discussion to be had about some of this stuff. So yeah, I think so too. And I I think this is actually like the first time we've been really discussing the heritage tree ordinance. Um, you know, actually putting it into practice. And I think we're beginning to see what are some of the limitations. Like what works? What are the limitations? What might we want to do differently? Um, maybe if we look at that as part to, part of the urban forest plan and or any other updates that you all want to make. Um, I think it's important that we learn as much as we can from this, from all sides. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. just well, from that learning perspective, I guess just one question for Jillian. If what I heard was when the original plan was put together, the tree in question was not 10 inches in diameter. So the architect, the property owner said, you know, we're, we're just assuming we can take this out. And then later at the final stage, so, if the tree had been 10 inches in diameter or greater at the time of the application, would they have at that point had to change the plan to accommodate the tree? No, they wouldn't have, but they still did submit a permit application. And I, I looked at the application form and I said, hey, this is technically not a heritage tree, 9.5 inches, but also this with tree inventory and the plans were like a couple months old. So I went out there and measured the tree and, and it was just like, just barely 10 inches. So it was protected. It was a heritage tree. And I, I talked with the property owner and I said, I know this is going to make things difficult, but it's a protected tree. You need to go through the process. If they were somehow able to move forward with their project while it was still 9.5 inches, um, we wouldn't be here today. Okay. They would have been able to just remove it without city review and approval. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I just wanted to make sure that the planning commission process does anticipate heritage tree constraints. Like plan, a plan can't get approved if if the plan proposes to remove a heritage tree. Is that is that true? I. I think um, unless we, the city has issued a permit for the removal of the tree. Yes, yeah, so that's my understanding. But Ori or Rachel, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, yeah through the chair, just as a point of clarification, uh, a plan can be approved if it's proposing to remove the heritage tree, provided that project uh, follows the heritage tree ordinance process. Okay, yeah. And, and I've been as a member of a public on a planning commission discussion where there was an ADU. And the way it was described to me, maybe incorrectly, but was that, well, the ADU just goes through, and it was a case where there was, it was a symmetric design, ADU and garage or something like that, or, or house. And because it was, the tree was on the ADU side, the tree went away. If it had been on the house side, it would, it would have gone through the period of So I'm 100% on, let's have a conversation about how all of this works, because there are all these things that, for a city that we care about trees, it's like, okay, what's the rule here? So, yeah. Yeah. Can it be transplanted? Um, that's a, a good question. It would be very difficult. It would be very costly. It would involve a lot of excavation that would impact this property and the neighboring property. You need to hire a professional tree moving company. Like, but again, like 
post live oaks, they can transplant pretty well because they are tolerant of, of root loss. Um, it would cost a lot of money, but I think it would be possible. Yeah. Good. But, but, but we have no ability to influence that. That's that's been kind of my point, right? Is yeah. we're exploring alternatives, and we right. we just have no ability to. Yeah. So it's yeah. too late in the process or whatever it is. Like we right. we can't say, please go back to the drawing board and consider these four things, as I understand. Yeah, that's my understanding as well, that we can consider the alternatives that have been proposed as part of the process. And yeah. Yeah. Okay. So if there's no more discussion, do we have a motion? I don't know. What are they, what are they? <laughs> we can we can move to uphold staff's decision um, to approve the heritage tree removal permit. All right. Or we I'll, can. I'll, I'll, I'll be the. I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it. I I move to uphold the um, um, the arborist um, decision. Thank you, Commissioner Pellegrino. Hurt. Do we have a second? I'll second it. Okay. Commissioner Lynn with the second. Um, would you call for a vote? Yes. Um, so we have a motion uh, by Commissioner Ford to uh, uphold staff's decision um, to grant the tree removal permit. We have a second by Commissioner Lynn. All commissioners in favor, please raise your hand. Uh, we have three commissioners voting in the affirmative. Um, all voting in opposed. We have three, so the motion fails. Um, oh, tie goes to Lou. Uh, there's no abstentions. We, we're just done. Okay, if the motion fails, then it's appropriate to make a motion opposite the first motion. So that's just. For the for the chairs. Okay. Reference. So, do we have a motion to um, uphold the? Oh appellants? wait, sorry. Thank if you. there is a tie vote, then staff's original decision to remove the tree is upheld. Well, okay. And this will still be appealable to the city council. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you all for working through that. Thank you everyone for your contributions and helping us understand the situation. Thank you for coming and speaking on behalf of the trees and the animals. And um, and I just, I feel really like the weight in the room around this. And I know, I, I'm imagining that this commission will take up some um, conversations. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so this is not the end because I know we all keep it. Yeah, all right. Okay, so with that, it's been an hour and 20 minutes. Shall we take a five minute break? Would that be helpful? Yes. Okay, let's come back at um, 25 minutes after the hour. Oh, that's okay. Um, okay. Yeah. No, I think I just wanted to yeah. represent the tree. Yeah. Sorry if I need to make it no, it's so far. So it's Thank you for hearing me. Thank you.
Are we, are we live? We're live. Thank you. Okay, um, moving on to item number D3, which is review and discuss the electrification permit fee waiver and permit stream. And I believe we have a presentation by City Staff. That's correct. Uh, give me one and Maybe while you're pulling it up, I'll just remind the commission again um, to honor both Robert's rules of order and to ensure we can move through our agenda items um, promptly. Let us hold your questions until the presentation is complete. Thank you. Okay, let's start from the beginning, which is a very good place to start. Indeed. Um, okay. Thank you, Chair Headley, members of the Commission. I'm Ori Pass, Management Analyst with Sustainability Division. I'm uh, here to provide an update on the electrification uh, permit streamlining efforts um, and the electrification permit fee waiver program. Maybe. Sorry. There we go. So this evening we will, um, I'll provide a brief overview of um, kind of the framing for these efforts, which is our climate action plan, specifically uh, climate action plan strategy number one related to electrifying existing buildings. Um, within that context, we'll talk about why permit streamlining is important, how the city has improved the permit process thus far, uh, and provide an informational update on planned process improvements. We'll then shift gears into a discussion of the permit fee waiver, um, provide an update on, on that program, and then uh, move into a commission discussion. And um, we are seeking a recommendation from the Environmental Quality Commission this evening uh, on the next steps for the permit fee waiver. So uh, later in this evening's agenda, we do have an item um, that'll be hearing uh, an update from the subcommittee on climate action plan strategy number one and the scope of uh, work to implement uh, this goal um, between 2025 to 2030. And so there will be an opportunity for discussion, uh, but wanted to do some, some framing for the, the permit streamlining and the, the fee waiver. And these are all uh, within the context, again, of, of CAP strategy number one uh, to explore policy programs policies and programs uh, to convert 95% of existing buildings to all electric by 2030. Uh, and this goal was set for a number of reasons. Uh, a big portion of them you can see on the pie of the city's community uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So in green, you'll see um, building energy use, which is natural gas. It's roughly 42% of the community-wide emissions total. And so a really good opportunity uh, as we look at our goals to um, eliminate emissions um, uh, to use that as a target. Uh, eliminating natural gas uh, and converting to all electric equipment provides a number of air quality uh, benefits, uh, both to the community and um, at the source of the equipment. Um, and there's a, a third benefit um, in the city of Mendel Park in particular, uh, because we receive our um, electricity from Peninsula Clean Energy, we provide carbon-free electricity uh, with an option for 100% uh, renewable. And so for each uh, piece of equipment or appliance uh, that's converted from uh, natural gas to all electric, uh, we see those air quality improvements. And then we also uh, see, see a reduction in the, the overall um, greenhouse gas footprint uh, because that, um, that piece of equipment is then being powered by, by clean energy. Uh, and so this, this is our, our top uh, strategy, our first strategy. Um, and we've been exploring as a city a number of different ways to uh, incentivize uh, residents um, and folks within the community uh, to, to convert to all electric. Um, and a number of those are related to um, incentives. Um, and then we've also been exploring different uh, regulatory frameworks uh, to to move us toward our, our goal target of electrifying 95% of the, the existing building stock. Um, and the permit streamlining is, is very important for a number of reasons. Um, every permit that takes advantage of these incentives or is uh, required to comply um, receives the benefit of a building permit. And so that there's a number of reviews to ensure compliance with state requirements, also life safety considerations um, and proper installation. And so, um, the building division and planning division um, 
and community development as a, a whole does a, a lot of work to to review both um, some of the smaller permits that, that we've talked about, um, ranging all the way up to the the large developments, and those are all uh, within their queue. Um, and so, uh, it, all of the efforts around uh, permit streamlining and process improvement are are really um, important in the context of electrification and Cap One at this time in particular because we have a tailwind of, of carrots, so to speak. There's a lot of uh, money and incentives uh, flowing in to support these projects. Uh, for example, we have uh, the first half of the four and a half million dollars from the state um, that's going to be deployed uh, hopefully this spring for a home, electri home electrification program to augment Peninsula Clean Energies. Uh, low income uh, home electrification program. There's a number of different Inflation Reduction Act incentives that are taking effect this year for uh, for certain equipments. Um, and it's like clean energy has their their incentives, uh, and then there's other state uh, tech incentives. And so uh, that coupled with upcoming regulation, which could be, um, you know, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about um, in the, the next item, but possible new versions of electrification building codes, as well as the Bay Area Air Quality Management District's zero NOx rules, uh, which should take effect uh, for water heaters in 2027 and 2029 for furnaces. Um, and they're they're looking to see whether or not the, the rules that they, um, they've put out are, are going to be feasible. And so all of the, the work that we do around um, improving the permit process um, to demonstrate that feasibility is, is critical. And I'd say the, the final piece, right, is, is this work, um, it really it provides returns and, and our partners in community development see that as well. Uh, if, if we are able to um, move projects through the process, uh, more smoothly, right? It, it reduces review complications. It expands staff capacity um, and, and improves customer service, uh, which is is very important to the um, the community development department. Um, and if you ask anyone, they're they are um, they're really stellar customer service uh, providers, um, and, a, and a pleasure to work with at, at the counter. Um, so we've been working closely with uh, with a team uh, that has representatives from planning and building and, and sustainability. Um, on a number of different process improvements. Um, I, I've provided an overview here. It's actually uh, more of an overview of kind of electrification uh, updates um, to date. Um, and so I think starting with the new chapter um, of online permit uh, submittals, which was started in, in 2020 and was, was a huge uh, um, process improvement um, because it allowed people to apply for permits online and then uh, moved from uh, a very uh, intensive uh, paper process onto an online portal. Um, in 2021, a building professional survey was conducted. In 2022, we hit the, um, the passage of the electrification permit fee waiver as part of the master fee schedule, which we'll talk a little bit more about later in this presentation. Um, we also developed some incent electrification incentive and requirement web pages, and then went through a process for building code uh, electric vehicle, solar, and electrification reach code amendments. In 2023, uh, we were awarded uh, an application for a, a solar um, solar application instant um, program, and we went through the process to amend the zoning ordinance uh, to facilitate electrification by allowing equipment in garages uh, and, and side setbacks. Again, looking to, to try to address uh, some of those barriers. Uh, and continue to incentivize the the electrification under Cap One, and then uh, this year uh, we we've gone running in 2024. We did a user experience testing uh, internally on for building web pages and online per, the online permit portal. Uh, we've also been uh, developing that automatic permit issuance for solar uh, that um, you know we were awarded by by the grant, um, and then we've continued web page and, and online permit portal improvements. I'll also note that as a, an ongoing practice, uh, the building and planning division staff do offer meetings uh, with, with applicants to review project scopes at any stage. And so uh, they really encourage people to take advantage of the, the appointments online and to come in um, as people are considering their scope. So you can, you can understand the process early, understand the requirements, um, and, and they will walk uh, anyone and everyone through, through the process. Um, and you can also contact them once you're in the process if you have any questions. Um, so 
within that framework, what we've looked at and, and worked with our, our partners in community development on are some planned uh, streamlining actions, right? So we're, we're going to continue the process transparency and user experience improvements uh, that we've identified uh, related to some web page improvements, um, trying to make the, the portal as user friendly as possible, and then also um, providing helpful information um, that that would appeal to a layperson, uh, as well as contractors who who may be familiar uh, with um, with the work itself. And we're also going to be uh, implementing the state solar automatic permit issuance grant uh, later this year. Uh, the building division um, plan checker has developed permit templates for a number of the electrification permits, and those are available on the website. Uh, and we're we're continuing to go through the the list of um, of those electrification permit types. Uh, and, and build out a um, helpful page that um, lists all the requirements and then add those templates as we can. Um, another big thing for, for community development generally and for building especially is uh, continued training for staff. So as, um, as information becomes available, making sure that uh, we're, we're sharing that and, um, and taking the time to understand uh, the, the evolving landscape, the new equipment, um, and then best practices uh, as as well, uh, some some newer things that that have popped up more recently um, was a uh, related to a possible change at the state level regarding uh, contractor license requirements uh, for flexibility, and so that has to do with uh, who's allowed to um, install new circuits. Specifically, it's it's related to to plumbers and something that um, we were made aware of. Um, and uh, we're tracking. Um, it's a, an effort by Silicon Valley Clean Energy. Uh, so we're going to continue to evaluate and track that um, and, and uphold the, the state requirements. Um, and then um, another thing that's that's that we've been thinking about is as we go through and, and provide, um, you know, make these changes to the web page and um, understand the, the process is, is packaging that in, in some way and um, trying to 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 make it available to contractors and then identifying contractors in, in some fashion who have uh, familiarity with the, the permit process so um, folks can evaluate that when, when making their selections. Uh, and then another big thing, I, again, I wanna mention is this uh, this offer and, and a lot of people do take take a step up on it um, and it really helps to, to get them through the process uh, more smoothly um, and that's meeting with the building and, and planning division staff. Um, the, those uh, appointments are available online um, and you can come in or make virtual appointments to review project scopes and permit requirements uh, upon request. And so that that concludes the informational update related to permit streamlining. Again, we, we do have the item related to the scope of work implementation for CAP 1. Um, and item D4 is going to follow. Um, so if there are items related to permit streamlining uh, that the commission would like to discuss as far as kind of recommendations on scope of work, that would be the appropriate time to, to discuss those. Um, and then as part of this, you know, if there's any clarifying questions about the update, we're happy to, to address those here. Um, but just in the interest of time, I'm going to move now into the permit fee waiver update. Um, and uh, again, the distinction is the first part was an informational update. This second part is is an item that we are looking uh, to to hear a recommendation from the commission to the council on. Um, and this second part again is the permit fee uh, waiver for electrification permits. So in August of 2022, the city council approved a permit fee waiver for electrification permit fees within the master fee schedule. Um, and as part of that, they directed staff to return to the city council when approximately $150,000 worth of permit fees had been waived or $150,000 of uh, revenue had been forfeited. And we were right around that time. And so um, with this presentation, yeah, staff is providing this update to the Environmental Quality Commission. The Environmental Quality Commission can then provide a recommendation and, and staff would bring uh, that recommendation to, to the city council um, in the next month or so. Uh, so just back from process to an update on where we are. Um, total revenue forfeiture to date or total amount of waived fees to date is 140923 um, so 
almost $141,000. We're looking at that, that is made up of 400 total electrification projects over the 16 months that this uh, fee waiver program has, has been in place. Um, on, on average, it's about $106,000 uh, per year. And we did the math and it's about $8,000 per month. Um, if you look at the breakdown between the different types of permits um, that have had their uh, fee waived, or the, the different types of permits that received fee waivers, I think, um, you see that the majority of them are um, part of a larger project. And so um, that's 48%. And so that could be a part of a larger addition or alteration mm -hmm. um, that include one of the, the electrification criteria. Um, and then the, the second uh, most prevalent permit type is, is just water heater uh, replacements. And so uh, we saw 103 of those uh, and 191 of the multiple projects. Um, next was uh, HVAC at 85 and then um, fewer and fewer. Um, but I, I'll say this multiple projects could contain some of the others. So it, it gets a little, a little bit convoluted. Um, the other exciting thing from a program standpoint to see is, uh, is this map of um, the locations for where permit fees uh, were applied. And so you see it's a fairly even distribution here. Um, I can walk you through the, the, the legend. Uh, you'll see in 2022, this is organized by year. So these are all of the permit fee waivers by year. 2022 is the, the darkest um, flag. And you see there's, there's a few um, distributed in 2023. You saw many more um, the waivers. Um, and I think in, in part that makes sense because the it was adopted in August. Um, and so you have less than half a year um, for 2022. Uh, in 2023, again, uh, more permit fee waivers were, were granted. And you see it's a, it's a fairly um, even distribution across the city in 2023. Four um, is the lightest blue flag, um, and you can see, you know, we're we're seeing quite a few already this year. And so the the next steps would be uh, to receive a, a recommendation from the EQC on how to proceed with the fee waiver, uh, and we would bring that to the city council. So tonight we're asking for that recommendation. Um, from the commission. And then the next step after that would be to bring the, the fee waiver update to the city council for direction on, on next steps or on how to proceed with, with the fee waiver. Um, with that, I can turn it back to the chair uh, if there's any clarifying questions. Um, yeah. yeah, so. Thank you, Mr. You. Pez. I, I do have a clarifying question. Yes. Um, on the section where it said other fees or the, um, the fees collected for remodels, I guess my question is, are there other fees that the city collects as part of the remodel process that do not include electrification? Yes, yeah. And so there's there are fees. Um, so the, the, the way it works for um, projects that are part of a larger project is there's a, there's a credit. And so depending on the number of electrification elements you, inc you include in your project, uh, you qualify for either, I think it's a 250 or a $500 fee waiver. Um, but yeah, the other plan check fees and some of the other um, state required fees uh, would, would still be okay. collected. Thank you. Are there any other clarifying questions? Yeah, go ahead. Um, two quick ones. So the recommendations I'm assuming are probably Continue stop or partial? Is that be whatever we want? Correct. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <Well. laughs> okay, but I, I'm just trying to. When you say recommendations, it's not about reshaping the program or anything like that. You're looking. You want to keep the program intact. Maybe it's a clarifying question. But a clarifying question. You want to kind of keep this intact. It's just you. Do you know? Are we going to keep doing it? Or are we going to stop it? Or maybe do a, a half permit kind of thing for, for the revenue loss. Is that, I guess, what, what kind of recommendations are you looking for? Maybe maybe is a better yeah, question. Yeah, sure. Okay, yeah, so I, I think at, at this stage, there the if there are program elements that are important to the Environmental Quality Commission that, that you recommend the council consider, yeah. this is the time to, to share those. Um, and then again, you know, it's with, with all of the items, if there are items, 
um, that as a commission, you, you decide on one thing and individually you feel um, there's something else or something of interest uh, you want to share, you are able to to go to the city council meeting and, and participate as an individual at that time too. Um, and second quick question, sorry, it's a, it's a, I think a kind of a dumb question, but I want to make sure I understand. When you were talking earlier in the informational section about incentives, that's not the same as grants. That's those exist. And if we do X, we're guaranteed to get Y. Is that, am I interpreting incentives the right way? Or, yeah, PCE state and IRA incentives. There's a lot of grants out there that you have to compete for. That's not what this is. This is if you yeah. do X, you're going to get Y. I think he's talking about individuals incentivized to electrify and then we want to we want to ride that wave that's happening in the country in the state and not put up barriers in the city is that right yes that's that's correct so these these incentives would be for residents to apply for and then they have there's some that are um there's income qualifications there's some that are not so okay yeah yeah okay thanks yeah i want because of the IRA thing, and there's a lot of IRA grants coming on the pipeline. I wasn't sure if that's what you meant, but I screwed it. Yes, and it, yeah, these the the IRA Inflation Reduction Act incentives, yeah, noted in this bullet are are for the direct installs the equipment because there are also incentives and um, in there for that. Oh, so that isn't for okay, got it. Yeah, all right. Please talk about it. Yeah, that makes sense. Cool. Any other clarifying questions? I, yeah. I, I'm sorry, I have some on the streamlining and some on the, on the, on the waiver. Um, uh, quick on the, on the waiver. Um, the, that other, do you know what that other is? The 70 something, yeah, multiple projects other? Is that mostly photovoltaics or, or, or do, you, do you mean what, what covers the other? So this is, it's a, uh... I, and I, I is it oh the multiple projects slash others it's when there's multiple different electrification measures or it's a part of a larger project um and so there's there's also um i think uh, battery storage is another um wave to yeah, so the like tides um and so I, I believe that's do, do, you, do you know how many how, how big those those pockets are um we can we can try to look that up in our um kind of it's, it's not a big yeah, I mean, okay. yeah. yeah. so so I, I do have several um ideas or suggestions or, or points on the streamlining because I, I i do care about that one so just try not to take too much time um so i was looking into yeah the permit. i think we need to well, i just want to uh, that was an informational item Correct. Right on the streamline. So asked whether it was. Yeah. So I guess I want to find out: is is this forum the appropriate place for feedback, or is an offline conversation better? So last time I asked this, just you suggested that this would be the right place. Well, so we're well, clarifying questions right now. Yeah. Right. Well, I think it's interesting because this agenda item has two parts. Yes. One is the informational item, and the other one is the permit streamlining. So. Yes. And so what the, do you want so from the stream <laughs> here? You okay. are presenter. What do you want on the streamlining side? I have feedback. Yes. Yeah, so if if there are if there are clarifying questions about the information in the presentation for the um, streamlining section, we can talk about those at this time. Otherwise, we should um, end the clarifying questions, open public comment, okay. allow um, anyone who's participating to um, participate. And then close public comment. Have the cool. commissioner discussion. Makes sense. As far as if yeah. there are if there are items related to the implementation or expansion or um, those types of things that that could be part of that cap one implementation within that permit streamlining, um, because we're talking about that twenty five to thirty scope of twenty twenty five to twenty thirty scope of work with D four. We're, we're hoping you can provide those implementation direction or recommendations as part of that. So then we can we can get that encapsulated into the the item that's discussing cap one implementation more broadly. I was with you until the last 
Um, but, uh, uh, so the, the last agenda item for today is D4. Yeah, I know. I know what it is. Yeah. Sorry. But uh, um, here, let's go with public. Uh, I, and and I, I'll tell you later, and then we'll figure out where, where it belongs. The, 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 the feedback on the streamline. Okay. Feedback on the streamline will follow the CAP 1 recommendation. It can be part of that. Conversation. And, and then you tell me, oh, too long, let's talk about it uh, in another meeting. That's fine. Yeah. It sounds like you're feeling unheard. No, 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 no. Oh, okay. Well, I want to make sure that we have a forum because you have a lot of really important ideas. So yeah, I want to make sure that no, you. Totally fine. Totally okay. fine. I, I swear. <laughs> okay. Yeah, sorry. Um, well, we'll make sure that we have the proper format for this. Yeah, so sorry. I, I, was, I was being a bit flippant, but but I I, I really meant I, I know that 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 I'll I'll get I'll give the feedback. It doesn't have to be here in this meeting. Yeah, can be I think that's the main question is like what's the best way? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so if there are no more clarifying questions, we can open it up for public comment. So um Mr. Paz, would you do that for us, please? Yes. So at this time we'd like to call for public comment on this item. If there are any members of the public present in person. I do see one raised hand in person. Um, and then if the others, um, the, they're right behind them. Thank you. Um, so we will get you a, um, a speaker card. If any of the attendees um, joining virtually uh, would like to provide public comment, please activate your raised hand feature. If you're joining by phone, uh, please press star nine to activate your virtual hand. And we will call on you. Um, again, at this time, I'm, I'm only seeing the one in, in person public commenter. Um, so uh, you're invited to speak. And please uh, strive to keep your comments to three minutes. Thank you. Uh, sure. Thanks, folks. Uh, Brian Schmidt from Mental Spark. Um, thinking back to that slide of the with all the dots so over the city of Menlo Park, um, I think that's a, a sign of success. Imagine if there were only two or three dots on that. It, it's good that we sh we're seeing a lot of that. Um, and in thinking about permit of uh, fee waivers and what should be done in the future, the framework I think might be useful to think about that is to think about cap one and the goal of achieving 95% electrification by 2030. If we were well in line with that goal or way ahead of that goal, then maybe we should be pulling back on the amount of fee waiver. If we're not, and if there's a danger that we're not going to hit that goal, then that probably suggests that we want to keep the, all the incentives in, in there to try and make it more likely that we're going to hit the goal. So I would think in that case, that uh, Mendo Spark's recommendation would be to keep up the, uh, the fee waivers in full. Um, one other thing to think about, and I know we're supposed to talk, talk about streamlining later, save it for that, but just to recognize that streamlining will also reduce costs for the city in a situation where the city is not recovering costs. Um, maybe there's some opportunity for getting rid of permit requirements entirely for things like hot, hot water leakage. So that's another way to reduce costs of this program to the city. And overall, it looks great. Uh, thanks to staff, for doing, to staff for the presentation. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Schmidt. Yeah. All right, are there any other public comments? Um, so I'll just call one more time to see if, if there's any of the the folks joining virtually, I'm not seeing any hands at this time. Um, please activate your raised hand feature or press star nine. So uh, see, and then I return it to you, Chair Headley, to close public comment. So as we um, begin to open this up for EQC discussion, Ori, if you could pull up the slide that has the amounts, the types of permits, and the amount, the dollar amount, that would be helpful for me at least. Um, thank you. All right, so as I was thinking about this, I agree with what um, Mr. Schmidt said. Um, I would like to see us reduce any barriers to electrification and the cost of electrification is really quite significant. So uh, anything we can do to reduce barriers for people um, is important um, to me. Uh, but the one exception to that, I wonder about the electric panel upgrade because I know we've been trying to lighten the burden on the grid and there are new technologies that let people electrify with like a hundred amp panel and that's the one thing i wonder should we maybe not incentivize the panel upgrade yeah that's my one 
maybe exception. And I could be convinced either way. Others? Yeah. Um, yeah, I hear what Chair has been saying. I think in terms of um, waiving the fee for panel upgrades, I would encourage us to keep that as part of the program. Um, with the idea that we're educating residents and businesses and building department staff on the ability to avoid panel upgrades. So um, I, I do think there are still going to be situations where a panel upgrade is needed. And uh, even if the homeowner or business does everything right, they'll, they'll still need to upgrade their panel. And I think it would be beneficial to waive the fee for that. But yeah, in general, I I say just keep the program going. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. McKenna. Yeah, Mr. Schmidt, Vice Chair Schmidt. I, I so I want to make sure um, I, I've got the the key nuggets here. So essentially, this is the city's giving up one hundred six thousand in new per fiscal. Is that like if we're going to boil it down? That's the yeah. that's the impact. Um. And then the, the maybe the second the second piece is um, the historical around the four hundred thousand where we're meant to give the the update to the uh, to the uh, to the city council was the feel of that conversation more um, in case this quickly capped into that so so instead of a hundred thousand a year if in year one it was all of a sudden four hundred thousand they didn't want the spigot to be flowing so fast was it it's actually 150 that's correct. 150 oh all right. i think the four hundred thousand was related to the bell haven yes oh apologies okay. well there was 400 total per so yeah, yeah four, i was thinking 400 400 total so so it was the nature of that conversation was like oh this could just mm -hmm push through hundreds of these things. We don't want to lose, you know, uh, an inordinate amount of money uh, because of that. Okay, so that's really the crux of the decision then is unless something drastically changes, this pace will probably continue. It might accelerate slightly, but it's going to be, you know, 10 months a year. So maybe the second quick question is, is there going to be any, uh, and I apologies if I missed this, any additional publicity or are we going to push this a little bit harder if we decide in the next five years to uh, continue this as people get more comfortable with doing this kind of stuff are we planning to push it harder or is it going to stay about the same from a, an average point of view yeah definitely um that would definitely be a part of the program like um i'm trying to mind read you here like sharing like Here's a new incentive that the city has, go electric, and that might help change someone's mind. Uh, definitely. And so that's something we could include in your recommendation to council. And then going back to that recommendation action, hearing that there's an interest to continue the program, it would also be helpful for staff if you could share for how long in perpetuity, one more year until 2030, for example, till 2027 when the Bachman rule comes. Um, because of the first kind of 150,000 was our, our pilot. And so we're approaching that around 140,000. So we're anticipating um, by the end of April or May, we're gonna need to go back to council um, to talk about next steps for this program. Okay. So what to can, do we continue or not and for how long? Yeah. Or until what criteria is that? And any recommendations around outreach are helpful. Okay. And do we want that as part of this or as part of our next agenda item? Per capital. This one, please. Okay. So, all right. So we all. I think I know the answer, but uh, we can't offset waiving fees on electrification by increasing fees on gas. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's not part of this program. But is that something the city could do, or is that not allowed? Uh, there's a. There's a. Like a uh, very involved process, so there would need to be a nexus study, uh, which would be like a multi-year process to to, under, to establish a nexus between um, one thing and the other, and then establish the fee that that reflects um, reflects that. Okay. 
use there. Straight it can't be used as a disincentive. We have to demonstrate that we have ex extra costs associated. So yes. Should we factor in the social cost of carbon? I don't know if that's part of the equation, but that's something we can explore. Let's go here and then yeah. Uh, just, just to uh, speak in, in favor of the program, I think that program has been very successful. Um, uh, I, I love that uh, the permits are available um, to the public, so I can go and look at that. And I, I did some some data mining on on that, and I know how many you have. So it's it very, very successful. And I, I, I tracked the number of uh, solar panels and and batteries. Uh, I think that the Part of the cost is because it's so successful. So, uh, and pro my guess would be that comparing it with the average um, uh, cost, it's probably unfair to the program because with NEM two, there there were there were a lot of uh, solar projects, mm -hmm. and I assume that your, I mean, all of those are free, right? So all the solar, all the yeah. uh, photovoltaics and all the the batteries. Why why doesn't solar show up there in that list? Yeah, but I mean, uh, that the, the the average, the previous number was probably uh, different, right? So it's like, this is, um, there have been many more additional requests than in, than in the past. So it's actually cheap, relatively cheap to, um, given the number of uh, permits that have been issued. No, no. So we're not. I guess my question is of the categories where we are waiving the permit fees. Why isn't solar on the list? Do we? They're, they're on the list. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's not there. Yeah. See. yeah no, you, you told me right on the where, where is multiple it on project solar. Uh, yeah, and, and the the other thing is that the solar solar permit fees were essentially eliminated. There's a, there's like a required state oh, okay. um, fee, so, so that, we, that's why they're not. Get that fee anyway. You can't. That's one. Zero. Um, or it's not we, we just we weren't including it in the in the reporting but it, it is certainly a component of uh, some of the, the multiple projects other um like electric panel or pretty probably is yeah. coupled with a solar panel yeah, yeah it can be yes and yeah. you said batteries were included not Correct. Yeah, batteries are included in other, and, and the permit fees are not waived for battery. Or the permit fees, as part of this permit fee waiver, are waived for batteries, but the the permit fee was not set um, like eliminated in the same way that the first solar was a few years ago. Okay. Cool. Any other discussion? Did you have one? Yeah. I yeah. Um, I would. I want to try to get to the question about the how long recommendation. Um, and apologies up front, I'm gonna step on my second, my second favorite soapbox uh, around counting. So, and if we don't know the answer to that, that's okay, but I, I, I'm i trying to figure out, let, let's take water heaters. And at this pace, number of permits looks pretty good, but what's the total number of potential water heaters to get into say the 90th percentile of total electrification? So using this counting backwards of that looks really good. So we realized to get to 90 to 95%, you know, we've got 40,000 water heaters in the city. So it's going to take us 75 years, right? So I, I know I talk about counting a lot, but it's hard to say for how long until we know how close we are to the goal of 100% of water heaters, you know, being complete or HVAC or so do we have any it's typically 10% I've heard of water heater replacements get a permit. Mm -hmm. It's less about that. It's sort of the total number of water heaters in the city using this United Way goal model of, okay, there's 100,000 water heaters in the city, 20,000 of them occur currently. You know, so I'm just, I'm trying to get to this idea of how close are we to some 100%. Yeah. yeah, so maybe that's part of our recommendation. Yeah. Yeah, because because so. you know that that it's hard to say is that are those good numbers or bad numbers relative to the overall goal of being one hundred percent electric, one hundred percent electrified. So, yeah. are, are you using the number each clarification on, on your comment? Are you using this no, this number to get a guess about how many water heaters we're doing? Or? Is eighty so HVAC is eighty five good or bad? 
to, in terms of the pace we need to be on? To be 100% yeah. of all HVAC systems <laughs> electrified is 85%. Not good. You're giving me good or bad? <laughs> no, we're, we're all going to the like, oh, deal's not good. Yeah. But, yeah. but like, but that doesn't mean anything about staff's effort and everything else. No. It's just yeah. relative to the total number of HVAC systems, that doesn't, none of these feel very good. So I just, I want to, I, one thing I'm, I, let's what I said, my second favorite soapbox yes. is I want to know like what a hundred percent is because then we can evaluate good and bad in that. Like we can tell the city council, this looks pretty good, but unless you're looking at total number of HVAC systems out there and it's going to take us 75 years to get to, so. Stepping off the soapbox and just making the company. Thanks, Jeff. Yep. So maybe in our recommendation, we can include the outreach component, the accounting component, and maybe we can say, like in my head, I'm thinking we continue this until 2030, which is when our goal is, and we count as part of that. So maybe it ends either in 2030 or when we hit, say, 90%, whichever comes sooner, Here. or we reevaluate it well, at 2030. Here's the thing. Once we know the numbers, and this is maybe outside of the scope, but permit waiver plus incentive to upgrade, put cash in pocket. So there's a, depending on how many years it's going to take us to get to where we all seem to want to go, there may be a second part of this that's more than just the permit waiver. Put a thousand dollars in somebody's pocket. Mm. But just to clarify, my understanding is the question on the, on the table is, do we continue doing the permit? Yeah, I'm not right. talking about the but second part right now. Yeah. I, yeah. But, but if this case, yeah, if it's going to take us 75 years to electrify all the HVAC systems in the city, then I think we need to have a second discussion. Yeah, which can be part of the cap one discussion that we have right. totally under, under the, in the, the next agenda, agenda item. But I, I just don't know whether 85 is good or bad relative to no, the total number of systems. We all know, we all yeah. know, we all know it's not. It's great. not. Yeah. Okay, so is there a, are there any other comments or are we ready to make a motion on this? All right. I mean, if the motion is keep the program in place, then it's an easy answer. But if we need to tell you for how long and to what extent, to what dollar value, then maybe we need more discussion or do we all know kind of? Well, I mean, I, I can I, make I, a proposal. Not, we could, yeah, we I, could do, we can make a motion, then we can make some friendly amendments Perfect. and then we can vote. Yeah. yeah. So does anyone have a motion they want to put forward? Oh, I'll, I'll yeah. make a motion that we keep the program in place until 2030 or we meet our 90% goal. I said that much. So just as a point of clarification, uh, the, the goal is the cap one goal? Yeah. Right. So that's 95%. Sorry, 95%. Yep. Okay. So I'm going to... Does your motion include a, like a dollar value per year cap or it's unlimited? Um, Okay. Well, no, that's the recommendation. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I understand. Get really clear on what the, and maybe we could actually pull it up so we can see it, and yes. then we can see if there's any friendly amendments that will want to happen. Yeah, because I, I want to see stuff. continued plus counting plus other yeah. stuff. Right? Yeah, so we can start with the basics and then do our add-ons. Thank you, Rachel. If you could make it a little bit bigger, that would be awesome. You have some old ones around the Yeah, I can't see it. Well, that made it better. Yeah, there we go. Okay. To keep program in place until 2030, or until we meet, oh, I think we were saying we would meet 90% of the cap goal. Is that right? Or did you mean you met the cap goal? So 90 or he said it, the goal is actually 95%. Okay, so you're saying we keep it in place until 2030 or we meet the goal. Correct. Okay, great. Yes. Um, it's 95% of homes. I think so. And so I would say, or until we meet the cap goal of 95%. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Existing. That's a baseline. Great. Whatever happens first. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Great. And then I think at this point we can do some friendly amendments, maybe around the outreach and around counting if we need to. So, so I think the process is you would offer a friendly amendment and Commissioner Kissel needs to approve it because it was his motion. <laughs> um, I, I don't want. Okay, so just to clarify, is that something? 
I thought the the the, the thing on the table was just about the waving, not about the, that. Seems like a separate motion. Well, I think they were also asking for feedback on the waving process, right? Right. It, not just keep, not just stop or go or partial, but but you were also asking for tweaks. If any program recommendations that you yeah. have now, if we can send yeah. to share. Yeah. Okay. So I suppose we could do two separate motions. Well, or we could just do one if it's I'm okay possible. amending. I just I think it's this if I was sitting on city council, this would feel internal if I had a sense of the pace. Like, oh, so we're gonna recognize this revenue again. So that's why I'm I'm proposing the counting is to give city council a sense of do we need to do more and or how long is it going to take us to get there? Is that, I mean, isn't that just data though? Right? I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's all data. But no, no, but I'm saying that if we, the city is going to have to, and, and the staff is going to have to measure every year to know whether we're at, 90, at our 95% goal. Right? There's no way. Yeah. But the 95% goal was bigger than the pieces. Sorry, right, so it was like HVAC assist, so measuring. So how do we, maybe yeah, I'm asking, I guess how are we measuring it? How I'm seeing it is, yeah. um, it, well, the question is really, how are we measuring our cap one achievement? Right. And this is saying, um, we want to achieve our cap goal and we want this program to support that. And we want this program to go until 2030 or until we hit our cap goal, whichever sooner. Right. So counting, I think, is assumed in this. And how I see it. Right. So from my perspective, the way it is now, it's 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 accomplishing two things. One is 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 forcing a measure of the capital of the cap of how close are we to the cap goal, right? And then the second one is saying, and we believe that this mechanism is useful to achieve that. It doesn't necessarily say is the only thing that will help achieve that, but that's a that's a different conversation. But it, it already has two different goals. One is different things. One is is, is forcing a, a measure. And then the second one is saying, yeah, we think that this is useful for that and we should believe that that should be continued. I have an idea. Do you want to go first? Okay. So my idea is maybe like to the end of this, we encourage, <laughs> we, we ask city council to direct staff to measure progress toward the goals on an, at least an annual basis. And to conduct outreach to the community to let them know of this fee waiver program. Mm -hmm. nice. I would accept that friendly. Okay. I guess I just want to add a <laughs> tiny bit of specificity though, because because counting to me doesn't mean cumulative counting of it's 85, it's 90, it's 90. Right. I'm not looking it's at percentage to goal, right? It's yeah, what 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 are the total number of HVAC systems? Like I just I want to get a sense of how close we are. That's the challenge yeah. I, well, I the always that Rebecca would always come back to, yeah. and she hadn't given us an update since pre-COVID, yeah. which was how much gas is being used by the city. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's like the one number we can actually know, because we don't know about if people install things without a permit. But we can know from PG&E how much gas is being used. Yeah. So I would like to see an update on that every um, year. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, go ahead, John. Yeah. Um, so I, uh, I it's important to measure progress. I don't want to overburden staff with that. Um, but if it's simple to just measure, you know, gas usage on an annual basis, I would be supportive of that. Um, and I think what Commissioner Kissel was motioning was that the program stay in place uncapped. The program now has a cap, I believe, at 150. So I was wondering if we need to, yeah, clarify that the existing program remains in place with no cap, other than we meet the goal or in 2030. But there's no $150,000 threshold there, whereby if we go over that, we stop because the current program has that. Well, is, it, is, it, is there a cap or is it a, a milestone checkpoint? Yeah, it's, more, it's, it's more of a milestone checkpoint. They haven't said one way or okay. the other whether. So, correct. Yeah, it's come come back when you're around 100. Yeah. 
Okay, so how does this sound? Your original motion. I like it. Okay. But can I, can I ask, sorry, I, well, so are we basically saying it's un, it's unknowable the number of HVAC systems that are in the city or it's unknowable the number of water heaters? Is that what we're kind of agreeing to? I, don't, I think yeah. that's separate. Right? Right. Right. That, that, that's parts. however right. we decide to measure the capital on priors. Okay. We, we might be able to get at you know how many you know, thirty five thousand people right and okay. so three or four people per household right even okay get some ballpark number to say there's you know, ten thousand or whatever and I'm okay with I, I don't know that we we will have an accurate count of how many ballpark one house might have two some might have one right. some might have two and a half it's hard to know given the circumstances okay but we yeah. can know gas usage. Fairly yes, and it's, that's it's, really what we yeah. care about most, right? right? It is, but I think I think people have a very hard time relating to gas usage. Right. The, the reason yeah. I get on my soapbox about counting is yeah. what can people relate to? So yeah. what's going to incentivize their behavior? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like I'm one of 50 people who haven't done yeah. this part yeah, of the yeah, yeah. You know, it's that versus like, do, do you guys ever think about how much gas you emit? Like nobody right. thinks that in human terms usually. Can, so can I suggest that we talk about the cap one measure? And the next topic up? Well, well, that's what, yeah, so that's where I was headed. Is I'm okay giving it up here as long as it comes okay. back into cap one. Because okay. I, I just, I want to make the counting a human experience versus I yeah. have to think about how much gas I emit. Like, right. that's just not relatable. So, yeah, I'm yeah. okay giving it up. Okay. Yeah. Um. So do we want to, given this, do we, would it be helpful, do you think, to staff to make this recommendation to city council about the progress I, I mean, ask just one clarifying question yeah. to Chair, and, and that's about this, um, the debt progress on an annual basis and to, to see if, like, if that, if there's something specific in, in there that you're looking for that would differ from the progress reports that we do on an annual basis, like the yeah. progress reports. Yeah, I guess I would like to see gas usage, the PG&E numbers. Okay. I'd like to see an annual because we haven't gotten it from 2019. That was the last number. Okay. Um, any others? I, I, I do. I, I agree. I do believe we're going to talk about that next, mm -hmm. next, next, next agenda topic. I, I do agree with that. Cool. Um, okay. Did that answer your question, Ari? And do you think we should include that as part of the CAP1 discussion and just keep this really clean? Part of me wonder if we just did it really clean. Yeah. Yeah. I'd recommend that. Okay. And so by really clean, sorry, just to go ahead. The Whatever. first part is just to keep okay. the program in place. So that's what that's the motion that we're going to vote on. Mm -hmm. Just the first part. Motioner. <laughs> What's that? I said through the chair, the motioner commissioner. Right. So that's the yeah, key. Make sure. So this is among the other topics that we're bringing up, we're going to cover in the next session. And I guess I just wanted to circle back with Rachel because you had said it would be helpful about the outreach. Um, do we want to say something? Like, and we encourage council to direct staff to let the members of the public know about this program. Like, do you think that, are you looking for that kind of support yeah, and guidance from the council? Yeah, the couple of recommendations. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. For what's worth, I didn't know about it. <laughs> and I actually yeah. heard at the PCE uh, board meeting, the, the Atherton rep saying, Oh, we do it in Atherton, and we other people should be doing. It. And I said, "Oh, great! We should do it too." And I didn't know we, we were yeah. doing it. <laughs> yeah. um, to uh, let the community know about this. Actually, let me think of the fee waiver. Great. Okay, let us all take a look. Do you have a thing to add, John? Just could you put a parenthesis around with no dollar milestone checkpoint? Yeah. Okay. Any other things to checkpoint though? Won't they want to checkpoint this? I would imagine they'd want to checkpoint it again. Well, we can make our recommendation. They can do whatever they're gonna do. Oh, okay. They can ask for a checkpoint. Okay, nit if they want it. Nitpicking, should we put a one after a cap? Mm. Mm. Yes. Mm. 
Okay, so to keep the program in place with no dollar milestone checkpoint until 2030 or until we meet our number one goal of 95% of existing buildings electrified, whichever happens first, and recommend that city council yeah, direct staff to conduct community outreach and engagement to inform the community of the fee waiver program. That feels comprehensive to me, noting that it doesn't include the counting, but we're going to discuss that in another. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Is it time for a so Would you call for a vote? Someone second. Oh, I seconded okay. it, but uh, <laughs> yeah, but whoever. Okay. okay. Uh, so I had that we have a, a motion from Commissioner Kissel, and then is it uh, second chair Headley? Is that? Yeah. Okay. Great. To keep the fee waiver program in place with no dollar milestone checkpoint until 2030 or until. Um, we meet the cap one goal of 95% of existing buildings electrified, whichever happens first, and recommend that city council direct staff to conduct community outreach and engagement to inform the community of the fee waiver program. Um, all commissioners in favor? Uh, and that the record show that um, we have unanimous votes in the affirmative and the motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Paz. Okay, uh, D4. We get to hear from the Building Decarbonization Ad Hoc Subcommittee. Um, ooh, it's been an hour. Do we want to continue on or do we need a short break? I'm okay continuing. No one's getting up. Let us continue. Um, okay. So take it away, Commissioner McKenna. So again, we'll hear the presentation from the subcommittee, clarifying questions, comments from the public, and then discussion. And thanks, Ori, for managing all the tech for us. Yes, it, it's very, very nice to have a, a team member, a, another team member uh, mm -hmm. here to, to help with all the tech. Um, okay, so here we go and, okay. Great, great. Um, well, uh, John McKenna, uh, Commissioner McKenna, um, along with Commissioner Pellegrini Yopart and Commissioner Kissel um, make up the uh, Building Decarbonization Ad Hoc Subcommittee. Um, thank you for the opportunity to report to you this evening. Um, just want to say this report was a collaborative effort. The subcommittee wants to thank Menlo Spark and others for their invaluable input, guidance, and support. Um, and this, this report represents the subcommittee's suggestions based on what we know today. We live in a never changing world, so it's important to stay abreast of new developments. Um, next slide, please. So just a real quick agenda, what we're going to discuss in the report. Next slide. A reminder of what the capital number one is. I think we all know pretty well at this point of the evening, so we can skip that. Just a real brief history of the subcommittee. Originally, we formed in July last year with the scope of work being to explore zoning updates, permit streamlining, leniency programs for permitting, uh, reach code updates for existing buildings, and methods to construct and electrify lab buildings. And then in October, uh, the EQC had a brainstorming session on cap goal number one. Uh, to recommend goals for and strategies for 2025 to 2030. Um, and out of that session, uh, a number of ideas were presented and voted upon. Each commissioner received five votes that they could allocate as they wish. Uh, all votes could go on one item or you could spread them out. And the top five vote getting ideas were those listed there. Reconsider burnout regulation, explore electrifying commercial buildings, instant permit process. Explore turnkey partner for multifamily electrification and allocate funding or support to improve building efficiency. Next slide. Um, yeah, so this is just a table that sort of shows the ideas again that I just listed and the subcommittee's recommendations for each idea and a timeline for implementation of those ideas. And at this point, if you could skip ahead to the next to last slide. A uh, spoiler alert. <laughs> I can try. This is our summary of recommendations. Okay. So uh, we are recommending that the city adopt a dual coverage approach to enhance the building code and um, 
explore companion programs with that uh, building code uh, enhancement that would be beneficial for equity and, and more impactful codes. We're recommend, recommending the city streamline the permitting process, which as we know is happening, um, and also um, look at an instant permit pro process for same location water heater replacements. And we are also recommending that the city support uh, PCE uh, development of a multifamily electrification program, or the city could explore uh, turnkey multifamily electrification partnering. So just wanted to go through those really quickly. Now we can go back and uh, dig into each of those a little more. Uh, next slide, please. So as it relates to the first two ideas, um, we think uh, the committee subcommittee believes that a enhanced building code approach would address both of those ideas. Um, and the concept is um, what is being called dual coverage. Um, so there are currently two reach code concepts out in um, out for discussion among cities these days. One is uh, an air air quality based ordinance. The other is an energy performance based ordinance. Um, I'll describe what those are in a little more detail. But what the dual coverage approach would entail is adopting both of those codes. Um, the subcommittee believes that that would be a much more durable and, shall I say, sustainable um, way to, um, you know, uh, electrify buildings in the city of Menlo Park and reach our goals. So the concept would be that the air quality uh, approach is based on NOx emissions. So it would be a zero NOx standard. And um, that code would be more restrictive and would be the one that would prevail as the sort of uh, code to be enforced. Um, but at the same time, the city would have this energy performance code, which would sort of basically have a backup. Should anything be, should the zero NOx standard be suspended or, or uh, you know, removed for whatever reason, then this single margin or energy performance code would be in place and would automatically go into effect should the more restrictive code be suspended. Um, this has a few benefits. One is that should the air quality based approach be suspended, then there's no downtime for the city to go back and look at a different type of code to replace that code. There's already a code in place, so there's no gaps in enforcement, meaning that you know unwanted emissions aren't gonna be installed um, as a result. The other idea is that if a city has both of these codes, um, it, it would seem to be less likely toward to litigation because uh, the idea being that if someone wants to uh, um, litigate against the air quality ordinance, even if they're successful, there's still this backup code in place. So there's not as much to be gained through the effort and cost of litigating. Um, so we, the subcommittee feels it would be a deterrent and, and again, would make the the ordinance more durable. Um, so next slide, please. So just to dig into both of these codes a little bit more, again, the zero NOx standard is based on nitrogen oxides, which significantly contributes to harmful air pollution and are produced when fossil fuels are burned at high temperatures, such as in building appliances and equipment. Um, this code would apply to all new construction throughout the city, uh, whether it's a single family, multifamily, commercial building, lab building, um, the equipment used in the construction of those buildings would have to adhere to the zero NOx requirement. Um, and there wouldn't be exceptions um, in, in, our, in the subcommittee's recommendation, such as exceptions for indoor or outdoor cooking or clothes drying, et cetera. The code would apply to all appliances, all equipment. And this code very easily could apply to existing buildings as well. Um, it aligns well with the Bay Area Air Quality Management District's uh, rule, uh, pending rule changes for water heaters and uh, HVAC. Uh, this would just accelerate that. Um, and uh, basically, again, if you know someone, uh, a business or a resident, has to replace a gas water heater because it's reached its end, end of its useful life or it, it's part of a remodel the zero NOx standard would apply, meaning that it has to be replaced with uh, equipment that complies to that, which um, could be gas if 
it doesn't emit NOx, but is definitely electric heat pump technology that exists today. And should the uh, city want to explore um, exemptions for technical infeasibility or economic hardship, or possibly putting some sort of cost um, threshold whereby, you know, if replacing elect gas uh, with electric is X percent greater than doing gas with gas, then then perhaps the, that would be an exemption. But that would be up for the city to decide if they want to do that and, and what that threshold would be. Um, and just by way of example, the town of Los Altos Hills adopted the uh, zero NOx building code uh, in February. And I believe the city of New York has a air quality based ordinance as well. Um, next slide. Uh, so this is a single margin approach, also called one margin approach or energy performance approach. Um, it's uh, quite a bit more technical, um, and it does allow for um, mixed fuel buildings to be constructed. Uh, it's harder to and uh, apply to existing buildings, um, but it does require um, that uh, a, a building, a new building, meet a certain uh, energy design criteria. And there's these different types of criteria based on source energy, efficiency of the building, total energy. But essentially, um, the city could set a, a margin by which the uh, the building has to meet. And uh, in, in effect, what it would do is an all electric building would meet that margin just by being all electric. Uh, in order for a mixed fuel building to meet that margin, it would need to be more efficient, a better building envelope, for, for example. It would need more solar on the roof, and it would need battery storage as well. And that that number, that margin number, can be you know set. Um, I, I believe there is some criteria that, that the city would have to adhere to from the state level. But um, in a nutshell, that's the way that code would work. And uh, cities such as San Jose, Santa Cruz, San Luis Obispo have adopted such a, a, a type of a code. Um, and the town of Atherton conducted a study session for this type of code. Um, again, all of these city examples, they've only adopted one or the other. Uh, no city has taken what we, what the subcommittee believes is a more durable approach of adopting both simultaneously. And next slide. So uh, policy is crucial uh, in order to meet the city's goals, but there are a lot of things that the city could explore as companion programs to that policy implementation um, that would benefit um, you know, equity and, and would make the policy more impactful. Uh, examples of that are um, putting in place tenant protection programs that would, um, you know, should, should a, a landlord be required to um, re upgrade their building with um, electric equipment and there's a cost associated with that, um, not letting that cost be passed on to the renter and potentially, you know, causing displacement or, um, you know, large increases in rent. Um, I believe the city's environmental justice element has a component of renter protection, um, but it may need to be enhanced. Um, one other thing that the city could look at is um, looking at ways to um, protect homeowners um, in the permitting and inspection process. Um, because when you're doing this work, you're getting a permit in order to get the rebates that are in place, um, or just because you're supposed to get a permit. And um, there can be some hesitancy to do that um, because you may bring an inspector into the home that might see other things that maybe are not in compliance or were done without a permit. Um, there might be a way for the city to sort of just focus on the electrification project that's being uh, permitted at the time. Um, another idea is to explore different funding mechanisms. So there are costs of you know, replacing gas equipment with electric, but maybe the city could look at different ways to um, generate some funds for um, homeowners and businesses that are going to incur those costs. Um, there's a few different ideas, uh, you know, a climate bond, a climate tax, um, and, and you know, we could really get into the weeds on, on how these might be structured, but these are just ideas for the city to explore. Uh, looking at the way they do their budget, make it more priority-based budgeting, um, and really focus on the city's priorities when they're doing their budget. And that could uh, direct money in the right places and also potentially uh, discover new, um, basically uh, increase the, not increase the budget, but uh, allocate the money of, of, towards the, the, the goals of the city. Um, one other idea is uh, currently 
In the Bayfront, if a building is built with mixed fuels, um, there are carbon emissions and the developers are required to offset those emissions by purchasing um, you know, carbon offsets. Um, we could look at that program and see if those funds could go back into the community instead of going towards um, you know, some offset program that may not be as impactful. Um, and so we, we would suggest that the city council instruct the finance and audit committee to look at these different uh, funding mechanisms. Um, another idea that, well, the subcommittee feels that outreach is crucial to the city meeting its goals. So even if the policies that are recommended are put in place, uh, a robust outreach program can really be beneficial to um, people not trying to work around those policies and just building community, um, you know, educating the public on uh, why, why the city has this goal and, and what these solutions are, um, how their decisions impact the, their, their neighbors and um, the city's goals, and just really being able to provide residents and businesses with the tremendous amount of resources that are out there right now, um, whether it's Peninsula Clean Energy's rebates or technical assistance, uh, the switches on program, which shows people what all the rebates are that are available at the time. Um, it helps them find contractors. So there's a lot of resources that um, could be made to the public with a real robust um, outreach program. And that would go to residents and businesses. Um, also um, really focusing on educating the, the contractors and the developers that are regularly doing business in the city um, to um, you know, get them to buy in on on these these uh, these goals and and these uh, policies and um, and programs. Um, we can go to the next slide. Yeah. So one other um, companion program. Uh, there's a, a concept of building performance standards. This usually applies to larger buildings, 25, 20 to twenty five thousand square feet or above, typically. Um, and, and what this basically is, is a way for um, to uh, create, like, um, there's a measure, like, you could say, we're going to target greenhouse gas emissions, or we're going to target um, site energy use. And what the, pro, the, the performance standard would say is, okay, day, day one, you're at this baseline level of energy performance or emissions. Um, in X amount of years, you need to be 25% better than you are day one. In another X amount of years, you have to be 50% better. And then ultimately, you have to get down to zero emissions or uh, site usage, energy usage. Um, this is a really effective policy tool. Uh, I will say that typically it's over a 20-year period. So this would not um, you know, achieve our goal, the city's goal. But it, it could be something else that the city explores in companion with in companionship with the, the policy. Um, and there's uh, other cities that have these types of um, building performance standards in place, New York, Boston, Denver, Chula Vista, and five others. I think there's 40 plus other cities that have um, sort of um, committed to doing this. Um, and then there's an organization called the Institute for Market Transformation that's helping cities across the country implement this program. Uh, they have a free model code that's available. Um, and speaking of model codes, just to go back to the zero knocks and the energy performance uh, code, those codes are available through the Bay Area Reach Codes website that was developed by Peninsula Clean Energy and Silicon Valley Clean Energy. So if you really want to dig into those codes, kind of what they are um, and, and, and what the languages look like for the city, you know, they can just adopt that language and modify it as needed. So it's a, a relatively light lift for the city to adopt that code because it's basically written for them already. Um, next slide. And so uh, just wanted to point out that um, the city's previous version of the REACH code exempted lab buildings. And um, the subcommittee did some research and there are many examples throughout the Bay Area of all electric lab buildings that have been built or are being built. Um, they're listed there. They're anywhere from Millbury to San, South San Francisco, uh, Newark uh, has an existing facility that's all electric. Um, so the um, just want to give the uh, the city the confidence that they can enact a code that applies to lab buildings because it's happening 
and, and uh, for good reason. Um, and then obviously existing buildings are uh, tough enough to crack, but there are um, resources out there. Redwood Energy has a guide to electrifying commercial buildings. Um, there again, the building performance standard could be an approach to larger lab buildings. PCE offers technical assistance. Um, and then just one example of a non-lab building, but uh, in San Francisco, there's a pro uh, an office project called Levi Plaza. It's 930,000 square feet. The owner there um, uh, committed to converting the entire building to all electric over a four year period. So they're replacing the, the gas boiler system with electric heat pumps. Um, they're doing some, some solar PV on top of that. Um, and so it can be done um, is, is the point of that, um, that item there. And just a fun fact, um, we often hear uh, concerns about the grid and what happens when there's a uh, power outage. It's all, these are all very real concerns, but if an earthquake strikes at a 7.9, it's one week of average downtime for electricity, it's six months for gas. So just a, a, an interesting point that I just, that the subcommittee discovered in the process of doing the research. Uh, next slide. Okay, uh, we can kind of go quickly through this because we just talked about it, but um, obviously the city is doing a lot of work to streamline the permitting process. Um, uh, the subcommittee's recommendation is yes, please keep doing that. I think the general recommendation is look at the scale of the work that needs to be done and um, do the best to streamline permitting in a way that uh, allows that scale of, of transition to take place. Um, and then to the idea of an instant permit process, the subcommittee fully supports that. Um, uh, Giving credit where credit's due, this is uh, former Commissioner Tom Cabot's idea. Um, but again, we, uh, the subcommittee supports the idea. Uh, in, real, in general, it's a great outreach tool. Uh, it, it has the ability to uh, reduce the burden on the SAP. And, um, you know, it's a simple tool that goes to every resident um, saying, here's your permit for a same uh, uh, water heat replacement in the same place. Uh, here's the criteria you have to meet in order to get the inspection passed. Um, so yeah, we support that and we would like to see the city explore that further. Um, next slide. Yeah, so explore turnkey partner for multifamily electrification. Subcommittee thinks this is really important. Um, we don't know that the city has to exactly do this on their own, but the city could encourage Peninsula Clean Energy to develop a multifamily program similar to their single family program. Uh, SVCE has a multifamily program that they're launching in May um, with $12.5 million, uh, 12 million in funding. Um, so that is uh, something that PCE could look to and probably already is, um, but to replicate that in, in PCE territory. Um, again, the city could look to establish a turnkey partner. Um, there are great organizations out there that do this work that could be a resource for multifamily building owners. Carbon Zero Buildings is one example that um, that I personally worked with and found to be uh, super knowledgeable um, and a great resource for multifamily building owners. Um, and then another thing that the city could consider on multifamily is um, adopting a building performance standard in, in, co in companionship with the code changes um, because some of these multifamily buildings are larger and could um, be served well by a building performance standard in place. Next slide. Yeah, so the, the, the fifth idea, frankly, we feel um, was uh, addressed by enough of the other ideas and uh, we don't have a recommendation to do anything specific to that idea. And you've all seen this slide and yeah, discussion. Thank you, Commissioner McKenna. You're welcome. That was a lot of ground we covered. All right. Um, clarifying questions from the commission. Got a couple. Um, first, just to say that that's amazing. That's a lot of work and a big swing for the fences, which is which is great. Um, but so did it, there's two small ones on the on the. Uh, adoption of the codes, the cities that you gave, the timeline and feedback. I'm curious, are those all relatively really new, or has there been some 
feedback so far where we could use that in front of city council to sort of say, hey, hey your child's going in, you know, San Jose or uh, Santa Cruz or whatever. Yeah, they're they're relatively new. I think all adopted within the last six months. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, to to you know, Los Altos Hills adopted in February, so it's okay. very new. Um, and uh, yeah, so there's not a lot of sort of experience to look to um, at those city levels. Um, I I do think in terms of um, the single margin approach, um, there are some things that the city needs to look at to be careful that it's really doing what. The city intends it to do. I've heard that there could be an issue with the energy performance standard um, as it might relate to ADUs. So just making sure that um, you know the intentions of the code meet the goal. So that, that would just be something that the staff could explore, and you know we'd be happy to assist with and put them in, in touch with people. Sounds good. And then my second question, I think, is more to staff. Um, the, the boy, I just could not get it out of my head of eventually this gets in front of city council. There's discussions. They want to approve the new cap plan. Um, if I was sitting on council, this one would be just really hard to unpack because it's got codes, it's got incentives, it's got programs, it's got so how how does that happen? Well, like would sorry, let me think of it a different way. Um would this be a multi-conversation piece and information sessions and everything with city council? Because if our cap updates were simple and they could be understood in one conversation, that feels very different from this and potentially some other things we're putting forward in the cap planning process. So I'm feeling like the cap, the cap update is going to be chunky and big and a lot of reach codes combined with all this stuff and it could scare them. So, so, would they reject it? Would they reject part of it? I'm just trying to get a sense of, not that we're going too big because I'm not afraid of that. It's just how do we how do we get this tied off given the complexity of some of the stuff and the breadth of it? Did, did that make sense? I it just yes. It makes yeah. me nervous that it's so big that they're gonna go, oh my gosh, go go back and like rethink half of this. Or or you do know, you wanna address that initially sure and then I'm not, so not just your part though. Yeah. So, yeah. I understand. I appreciate the comment. Uh, the climate's a big issue. It's going to take some work to solve it, to address it. But um, the subcommittee's recommendation is adopt the two codes. If the city wants to explore other programs to go with that, that we think would be beneficial, we support that. But the recommendation is adopt these codes. Oh, okay. So, so just on, on, on that topic, I, we, we did talk about um, there's a lot of material in here. Uh, um, for example, I mean, on the slides on the um, companion programs for equity and impact, uh, that, that's two slides. There's a lot of material in there. Yeah. Uh, we debated whether to leave it out or not because it would make the message as as as, as, uh, as John was saying. I mean, there are these things that for sure, and then there's all of these other ideas. Right. It, it, we felt it. There is some value in leaving it there, but maybe at presentation time it might be, maybe it can be presented with slightly different so that the, the, the bulk of the of the punch goes and it doesn't get a, a bit noisy. Because I, I mean, if you remove those two, then it's it's a rich code. Is uh, there are, there are very few points. I mean, the points are complicated. I mean, the rich code is, is complicated. But okay, that's that helps. And that was not a commentary, by the I, way. I, it was just the. I could just imagine getting that and not being an expert in this and all that and going, oh my gosh. So, yeah. It, yeah. Okay. Anyway, we can talk more about it, but that, that helps. Thanks. Can you go back to slide 105 just so we have it up there? That's the summary of recommendations. Any other clarifying comments or questions? I, I did have one clarification on, uh, on a personal level on the previous slide, the slide before this, yeah, the, the number five. Um, I'm the I'm the newbie to the to the to the team, right? So I introduced this one uh, early on, um, and when I kind of removed it, is in, in part is because I thought it was covered by the other ones. Um, when we go to the uh, discussion about uh, the whole topic, I would like to go back to this point because I, I'm, it's not clear to me how it impact how the the municipal 
uh, code interacts with Title 24 and with with something like the margin, the simple margin stuff. So there are some nuances in there that I would like to bring to the table for all of us to to talk about. I guess I have a maybe related to that. I have a clarifying question. Yeah. So the dual coverage approach is that for new buildings, and the building performance standard would be for existing buildings. So or so the, the dual coverage approach. The zero knox code is for new buildings and existing buildings. The energy performance standard is for new buildings. Building performance standard is existing buildings. Yeah, we, we, we could talk about the discussion because it, to me, I mean, it's a bit confusing. And I, I mean, I, I was actually having a conversation with Rachel about that earlier. Okay. Thank you. Any other clarifying questions? One and then we'll do public comment and then discuss. Small one, because I think it's a broader discussion, but I'm just curious. Is um, I've, I've noticed that often there's a reluctance if something for existing buildings and other things like that, if it creates a financial burden, um, there's a real reluctance on council. Uh, so I'm just curious if that was something the subcommittee discussed and there's ways because when I look at the like the no financial incentives, but it's sort of built in, is that was that part of the discussion or would that be something city staff would really need to flesh out a lot more? Because I, I think about it, you know, we talked about waivers, we didn't talk about subsidies to address the gap. But, but it, you, you guys have thought about it a little bit because that, that's the part of the reach code stuff that I, I worry with impacts because they, they are very reluctant. To so as long as you've discussed it, there might be some I mean, it's, it's, it's in the it's in the presentation, okay. About, Specific sanctions for technical feasibility or economic hardship. Okay. Okay. That was the, yeah, mm -hmm. that was the question. Okay. Um, let us go to public comment then. We have okay. a hand in the room. Uh, I've got my okay. Thank you. Yes, yes. We also have a, a, another hand, but a virtual hand in the room as well. Great. So I um, will um, first go to the, the hand in the room and then we'll go to the um, public commentary. So um, we have Brian, Brian Schmidt, you're uh, welcome to, to speak on, on this item. And um, please, if you can, keep your comments to, to three minutes. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Brian Schmidt, hand in the room, and then we'll start. And, uh, 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 to support the, the subcommittee recommendations. So I think that summary at the end is really succinct and very helpful. Um, uh, Commissioner McKenna's description saying we are supporting this dual coverage is kind of the core. And a lot of the other things that are in there is how to make that, how to facilitate it and make it happen. It seems to me that it works really well and it sends the city towards its goal, 95% electrification uh, by 2030. Uh, and uh, just some other things that I added in terms of the backup to that is, even though I'm an environmental lawyer and I've delved into the legal aspects of this, I'm not sure how how useful it is for this committee to for the commission to dive into that, um, except to recognize that there is some level of legal risk for the air quality standards, um, and uh, that's why there's, in my opinion, it's useful to have a backup, and the backup is not as good as air quality standards for quite a few reasons. Uh, if we were just to use the backup, you're giving up a lot. And you're giving up a lot to the gas industry, which is the whole reason why this is on, this is happening. And I don't like giving things up to that. <laughs> but uh, uh, one other thing I, I wanted, I actually, two other things I wanted to add to that is, uh, and it's a clean energy in Silicon Valley, clean energy is, as John said, they're working on, uh, on these codes and they're working with consultants to explain that. Uh, one one uh, advantage that they mentioned for doing this and not just relying on the, the uh, air districts is that uh, these codes uh, doing this on a local level can regulate remodels or other types of triggers for building electrification. Uh, they have that on their website. Uh, I made a bunch, a bunch of copies of this so we can distribute it if we want to. Um, so PCE recommendation? Yeah, yeah, this is the consultant that... Uh, that PCE and SVC hired TRC, what they call, uh, they, they met with staff 
Uh, um, could, could you share that with us digitally so we can include in the minutes? Of course. Um, so that's the center of reason that they have listed there. Uh, and then the other partner that the city can rely on is if you look at this is PCE Direct. Uh, I think they are very interested in helping the city figure this all out, uh, both on the technical level and on the legal level. Um, and Mental Spark is also interested in making sure PCE works with the with the city, and we'd be happy to work on the on the PCE level to make sure that happens. So for all those reasons, I hope this goes forward. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Okay, seeing no other hands in the room, I'll now turn to um, the raised hand online and uh, Angela Evans. So you should be able to unmute your microphone and uh, please strive to keep your comments to under three minutes. Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's Angela Evans of Menlo Spark. And I will keep mine short and sweet, but wanted to say that. As part of Menlo Spark and a former EQC commissioner, I am very supportive of the building decarbonizations presentation tonight and wanted to thank you and specifically Commissioner McKenna um, for your thoughtful approach to all of this. Um, I think the content is excellent and thank you very much. That's all. Okay, well, thank you for the public comment and for all the work on this uh, recommendation. Okay, so I, uh, it's time for some discussion. And um, for me, it would be helpful to pull back up slide, but I think maybe that final recommendation slide. 15. I have it as 105. Is that, I think it is slide 15, but yeah, one. number 105. Also no one asked me Okay. Um, and I also, I, I guess, linking our last um, topic and the things that we deferred to this conversation. So we have the, the counting and the permit. Um, yeah. So I see that the city, the recommendation is to include streamlining the permitting process here as bullet number one, two. Yeah. Um, I saw that having a community dashboard was part of one of the things to consider a number of slides before, but didn't make it to this summary slide. So <clears throat> those are some of the questions I have for this group. Like, do we want to elevate the community dashboard as part of this? Does that bullet yeah. feel sufficient for what we've been concerned about with regard to streamlining the permitting process? Could, could, could I build on the, on the comment you made about uh, um, previously on on the gas usage and mm -hmm. and gold because uh, honestly when when I joined I when Angela left I I was had the opportunity to join so my first question to the subcommittee to us was how are we going to measure this ninety five percent electrification step and um, and it's very easy to measure gas usage so my posit to the table was well let's measure the equivalent to 95% electrification by, by measuring the reduction in gas, right? So it's like, okay, if, if it had 95%, then the gas usage should be this. That doesn't mean that we know which houses are, which households are electrified, but we know the equivalent. So so back to the, the dashboard, I would love, as a, as a member of the EQC, but also as a, um, a, a resident of the city, I would love to see that number. It's like, how close are we to the equivalent of 95%? And that's relatively easy. I believe that's a relatively easy number to compute. Computing 95% of uh, households being electrified, I think is extremely complicated. Because, because the only tool we have to do that is just permitting, but we all know that there's a lot of activity that is not permitted. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. Yeah, go uh, ahead, Jeff. Two, 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 um, Slightly unrelated. One, one to Eduardo's comment. Um, I, I think my concern with using gas, aside from the human and outreach and getting people inspired, I, I think we would all agree reach codes are one of the toughest things to get city council to push for, typically, from what I've seen over the last few years. And so having positive uh, 
president excitement and speaking to the importance of it and everything else, I think uh, builds confidence in the council to pursue these things. That's sort of how I've seen it play out. So I, I hear the point about it could be hard to count and make the data relatable, um, but I think it could also benefit us in giving city council confidence that this is what people want. You know, because if you're involved in all this and you're, you know, neck deep in it like all of us, then gas makes a lot of sense. But for the average 50 person who doesn't think about it as much, I don't think, you know, gas is going to sway them. Yeah. So I, you, you I, should say. I, I, I think I 100% agree, uh, understand what you're saying. And I, I at some level, I agree. I don't think it's an either or. I think you can do both. Yeah. Right? So, so for example, guess, yeah. I mean, what, one of the things yeah. that I was doing, um, and, and kudos on the on the city ability, uh, permitting um, website. I mean, you can actually download all the permits uh, and do data analysis. So I downloaded. I did. There, I got there are thirty one thousand permits. Yeah. I can tell you there are six hundred and fifty batteries and uh, right. 30, those numbers, you can produce those numbers and you can see them going up. And I, I, I agree and with you. People yeah. get excited about that. Yeah, that's it's the it's the United Way campaign model. So I, I, to be clear, I'm not saying we don't count gas. I, I want to be real clear. I just don't think that motivates people. I think what motivates people is we've got a thousand commercial buildings. We've got 750 of them electrified. We've got 250 to go. We're almost to the finish line. Rah rah, let's go. So I, I it's it's not a an either or. It's a let's count gas if that's easy to do, but let's not stop there. Let's yeah. make it relatable. Right. So yeah. that's kind of one thing I want to I, I get off the soapbox again. The second question is the reach codes. Uh, so I asked the clarifying question, then I have the kicker question around the other cities. Uh, I'm assuming you guys have kind of looked at that as the thinking we lift and shift. Because uh, Brian's comment about like PCE and Silicon Valley Clean Energy working on it. Is this something where we could just take this and it's 95% Menlo ready and we do 5% tweaking? Or I'm just trying to get a sense of well, like how that would Yeah. So the model codes have been published. Yep. They are available for any city to adopt, and by as they see need as they see need fit. So, yeah, um, does that answer your question? Sort of. And then did the other yes, um, but then did the other cities do that? Did when you? Sorry, I'm not saying you should have done it, but like if you compare um, Santa Cruz to the model code. Are you asking did, what tweaks did they make? Well, I, I'm curious. One is I wanted to make sure it was a relatively like a lift and shift. And then the question is, do you feel like they modified it a lot for each city or did it feel like they just kept it mostly as is, or could you tell? Um, <clears throat> so Los Altos Hills um, modified the code, uh, although I'm not even sure the code was available to them. Oh. Uh, I think they were sort of the, the lead on, on doing that. Um, and so there's that, and then, you know, the. Energy performance um, is super technical. I, I don't know what cities did uh, compared to you know, the model. If there is a model, was there is a model code. Um, but I'll just say that the subcommittee's recommendation is that you don't modify the code. Oops. No. Make it easy as possible. And, then, okay. and, and as um, powerful as possible. Yeah. Without exemptions or exceptions. Yeah. The, the science is telling us what to do. We have to decide if we want to do it or not. Yeah, and that's why I keep asking the question or bring up city council is there's a political will aspect to this that I hate to put in all the work and then we all kind of know what that feels like and then it's against the they take a vote for various reasons. I'll just say philosophically for the subcommittee is we need to recommend what we think is necessary. If others don't agree or want to change things, that's, and they have the power to do that, that's their choice. But the subcommittee is going to recommend what they feel is necessary yeah. to achieve the goal. 
And in my view, that applies to the EQC as well. We should recommend what we think we need to do to achieve the goal, and city council can make a different political calculus if they need to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I fully agree with that one. The, the, the one comment, and now we're going back to the, the comment I had made before about the deficiency, uh, because I think it, it kind of intertwines with this. The part that I, I still don't understand, and I'm, I'm, again, I'm the newbie, I'm just trying to learn all of these things, how do the the Title 24 um, efficiency standards interact with the mental part um, um, the code? Um, in particular, the example that comes to mind to me is, let's say that we go only with the NOx2, right? Um, then somebody can install a very inefficient house that is um, fully electrified, that is using only resistors and is using a lot of electricity from the grid. That's going to be very expensive to the user of that house. It's going to be bad, bad for the grid. Um, and it, it, at the end of the day, it's it that that's not good for, for all of us. Um, because we're, we're talking about reach codes. So there's the state code that the city has to comply with. Which well, the that, 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 that's the a reach part, codes go further. I understand, yeah. I understand. But but in particular, that's the part that I was having a conversation with Rachel before, and, and mm -hmm. she said, "Well, I can bring it up here," which is because the 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 uh, Title Twenty Four has the required part, and then it has the the, the second law. Yeah, the tiers, right? And then in particular, all of this started because I was looking into the impact of batteries and uh, photovoltaics, which um, in part is, is driven because our rates are so high, right? And and a, a, a very a good way to reduce the rates of residents is to give them additional benefits, which solar photovoltaics, community solar, batteries, et cetera. And all of that is actually in the 2022 Title 24, Title uh, 24, but it's only on the reach side. Is not in the required side. So and I don't understand how all of that works. And that's what I was asking. Were you signaling to me that you had an answer to this? Oh, well, I I thought the question was going to be if, if the standards still apply. And the answer is yes, there's like a base, and then you have to demonstrate that your your any reach code is compliant. And then um, also, but there it sounds like there's a question as to whether or not the tiers. Should yeah, well, I mean, the, the, the question was, uh, what's the process, at what point do those things make into the municipal code? Mm -hmm. and, and my understanding from the conversation was, well, if if it's on the re on the mandated side, then it happens every number of years, whatever it is. But if it's on the extent, on the second lap, on the, on the optional, then that is the kind of thing that we would do by recommending we should do this thing. So in particular, for example, in the case of electrical um, residential buildings, one of the required of the optional parts is to require that all new buildings and major remodels will be ready photovoltaic, but also ready to be to install a battery. And if you have photovoltaic, mm -hmm. you have you are required to have a battery that accepts one or two hours of the production of the photovoltaic. So think about that. I mean, that means that anybody that gets a house automatically is getting a battery that will reduce their their cost, their electricity bill by a significant amount of money, and that goes on the on, on, as part of, of building the new house. So it would, I mean, I would love to have that into the municipal code for metal park. And so, so part of the question was, how does that work? I mean, that's part of the efficiency part that is not in the electrical. But at the end of the day, it, it benefits electrification because it means that the people will be more ready to actually electrify because it's cheaper, right? Okay. And what you would like to see as part of the recommendations, that's not included in bullet number one here? I, I don't okay. know how everything fits together. <laughs> My question is, is that is that already included? Uh, or, or is not. I mean, when yeah. I said that number five was not necessary, is because I thought it was included, but then I started thinking about it. I don't think it's included because it's a 2022 Title 24, right. and that's not yet there. I don't. Does that make sense? My... I think I'm as unclear as you are. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If, if I may be the chair, the 
the, the process to adopt the tiers is it, it's, the, it's the same process as adopting a reach code. So if, there, if the recommendation of the subcommittee is, you know, what we're talking about, then kind of the next stage just framing the conversation is the commission as a whole has an opportunity to uh, evaluate and then make a, an overall recommendation for cap one scope for 2025 to 2030. So if, if there's an interest in, in modifying this proposed reach code to incorporate some of the um, Cal Green tiers, yeah. um, then that would be the appropriate um, avenue to do that. But we, we wouldn't do, yeah. I mean, yeah, we, we, can, we can bring that to, whatever the commission decides as the recommendation would be what we would bring to city council and then staff can evaluate kind of the how of it between now and when we go to, to city council. And the language you just said was consider adopting the Cal Green tiers. Is yeah, that right? Yes. Yeah. Those are the, and there's two tiers. So it would, I think, be helpful to understand which tier. I think, no, which tier, but yeah, which tier, if that is a, the, yeah. the recommendation from Commissioner Rodriguez. From. Yeah. Go ahead. May I offer that in, what month did we say? Did we say April or May? May, we're going to come back for a reach code study session type presentation. Um, and so we can be sure to include what the Cal Green tier one and tier two options look like as a part of that presentation. And that's part of our sequencing to bring reach codes to council for a study session per their recommendation on March 12th to do so. Okay. Okay. Does that, that work? Yeah. That okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. That was actually, um, I want to make sure I have this straight in my head because I think there's the recommendation of the subcommittee, which gets into the creation of the updated cap plan, mm -hmm. which then is further discussion. So we can agree on everything that the subcommittee says. There's a further round of discussion on the cap plan itself and what what gets put forward, forward to city council. Can I just pause that? Yeah. My understanding is we're not updating the cap plan. We're talking about the strategies for 2025 to 2030 to achieve the cap plan. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think we're. I, that's kind of what I meant. I okay. guess what I'm what I'm trying to figure out is, and I, it's a broader discussion. We don't need to have it here. My worry is with reach codes. Is it better as as Commissioner McKenna said? Is we just put forward the recommendation and then City Council does what they do. I'm worried that like if we know it's not you know you know you don't have the votes kind of a thing in the political sphere. So does that start to wash out through the study session and the educating the city council and the bringing them along? I, I just want to make sure we're putting forward something we know is going to win versus putting forward something we all know might not have the votes. And I'm not trying to make a prejudgment of that. I'm just I hate wasted effort uh, around something like this when. You see what I'm I'm trying to get at is how do we how do we make sure we get the votes and is that part of the process that you're both describing? Sorry, I, I... yeah. So we're we're bringing the study session back to council and we're still working on how we're sequencing it. Hopefully, we're able to bring the cap 2025 2030 work plan first, um, and then we'll have the study session on reach codes. Um, and at that point, we would present the universe of options available, specifically the air quality and the EDR um, per council member doors request um, on March 12th. And so that's what they wouldn't make a, a decision at that point. They would direct staff to come back with ordinance language and they would detail what they would expect to see in that ordinance. Um, so we wouldn't do any kind of free work on you know putting together an ordinance. But there's certainly a lot of internal work, but Got it. That so that then they can flesh out their discomfort or comfort yeah. through that process, as opposed to like here's a reach code. You got to vote on it. If you don't vote on it, then okay. And that, it wouldn't that, impact um, how they vote on the cap either, because the cap adopting the cap work plan wouldn't mean they're adopting all the policies and programs within the cap. It's just giving staff direction to go forth and pursue. Okay. Yeah. Could they? Yeah, that's my that's what I'm trying to articulate this concern of like, will we have the votes to make this stuff happen with all the effort that we've all been putting in? So that that helps us. Yeah. Okay. And I feel like it's a really good sign that the vote on um the study session mm -hmm. was like a yeah. borderline vote. 
So they they want city staff to come up with recommendations. Yeah, I'm not worried about the recommendation. I'm worried about the the big swing. Sometimes if you have a conservative voting group, yeah, you know that's reasonable to keep that in mind. Thank you yeah. for raising yeah. that concern. Okay. Yeah, I, I I can. Maybe at the end, when we talk about the sharing, I'll, I'll, uh, I got a, some good leads on, on summaries for the, the 2022 uh, Title 24 uh, part. It, it, I mean, I got there because I wanted to save money. Yeah. yeah. So I don't think it's going to be that difficult to get, but I mean, I wanted to submit, uh, save money for, for uh, residents who are electrified. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, this could essentially function as a motion if we're ready to go there. Mm -hmm. If anybody wants to make a motion. Yeah, I'm hurt and this. So we just yep. jot it down. Could if we could elevate the dashboard as yes. one. And then gas, count gas. Oh, that's fine. Plus an aspiration to count like the total numbers of stuff. Or yeah, multiple metric points. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And backups. Mm -hmm. We're repurposing our last motion, so there we don't lose a thing. Yeah, no, we have it. Have it. Are you <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Use it and delete the other one. No, no, you haven't. Uh, All of it. So it was a motion from. We have not really made a motion yet. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I think we, if you want to copy and paste from the PDF the uh, presentation. Yeah. On page 105, I think we were about to add a couple of uh, items related to metrics. Yeah. Maybe. Yes. Okay. I have the Is someone thinking about the metric language? Thing? While they're editing, I think Commissioner Schmidt, who feels strongly about this, is going to. I will take a study. <laughs> <laughs> did you guys have a dashboard on the agenda? We could grab. We did. But no, it was it was actually, in there, uh, like in. Uh, yeah, it was in the final summary. Oh, yeah. Was, not in the final summary, but I'll find it for you. We could grab it. Okay. Well, well, one of the metrics I'm going to try to find out is I want to find out from PG&E where they can tell me. What uh, uh, properties have been have shut down gas? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because that seems like you could get that. So the language, whenever you're ready, Rachel, that was included earlier on page 99 was uh, create a community dashboard to measure and track, properties, and specifically to create an atmosphere of togetherness. Which we can include that last part or not? Yeah. To measure and track progress. But I, I like the yeah, yeah, like we're all we're in this together, so we need to have information. Have yes. you electrified ninety five percent of your? You know, it's interesting. Well, many of you have been approached for the water usage, but we did a water usage on re landscaping, and I think that they said we'll put a sign like the dashboard yeah. in your yard and be yeah. It. Yeah, and I've seen it in a few other yards, and you could do the same. Thing. Well, sorry, yeah. Yeah. make it like yeah. the last one. I have. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 It's it's a, a visual. Yeah. 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 I don't know why that was. Are you doing that? Let's focus, guys. A Google Maps. Yes. What did you show? Okay, so let us bring our attention here and begin to formulate our our motion here. So we have the dual coverage approach to enhance the building code. Um, explore companion programs for equity and impact, streamline the permitting process, including the same day location, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> instant permits. Yeah, go ahead. Corey. So if I, may, I think it, it would be helpful in our conversations um, moving forward, because we're going to be working closely with community development. I think it would be helpful if we could get a definition from the commission as to the, what permit streamlining means to the commission. Um, I don't know if, if that's something we can uh, work out now as part of this uh, might be the cleanest, um, but I do recognize that it's 919. And, yeah. um, I'm happy to provide ideas if you want. Yeah. Do you want it now or? I, if, 
but whoever is making the motion is comfortable oh, okay, with that, okay, then yeah, I, I, yeah. yes. I don't think we've teed up the motion yet. I think we're trying to learn it before anybody. Right. But, he's, but he's saying in the motion that we could yeah. give more specificity to what we mean by streamline. Before we have ideas, though, it, we, how do we count it today? Is it days days to permit, or what's the what's the way we, what's the metric today? I'm sorry, say it again? I was trying to figure out what the metric is today. Is it days, for to, days uh, to receive the permit? Straight so in the streamlining, are we streamlining number of steps? Are we streamlining time to permit? What's the... That's a question. Yeah, so there's a there's a number of different definitions of permit streamlining. Some have to do with priority permits. Some have to do with, like, you know, we've been focusing on what are the, the areas within our control to increase transparency and reduce the number of days it takes to get a permit. That, that's what I was asking is how the city counts it today. So the city counts yeah. it by number of days to get a permit. Well, yeah. So another, another metric that I'm, I, I, I've experienced as uh, um, somebody selling solar panels is the number of um, institutions Iterate. that you have to coordinate or your contractor has to coordinate with to actually get a permit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in particular, the fire department is a uh, complex thing. And, mm -hmm. and that was part of the feedback I wanted to give back, right? Is because I think bubbles are good. Yeah. No overall number of days, and as a like how much coordination do you have to do? Yeah. And like reduce the number of touch points and yeah. reduce the back and forth. Yeah. 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 I mean, the, the, the way it is now today is for for those days, you have to do, you have to do it multiple, but also in a particular order. If you're doing it in the wrong order, you have to redo it. Mm -hmm. I, my sense about the permit streamlining, that could be a whole subcommittee that goes off and thinks deeply about this and comes back with recommendations. Um, so maybe that's one of the things we we create as part of this. Because um, there's also research going on at Stanford specifically on not just for building electrification, but for some of the climate permit. So yeah, there might be best practices out there as well that you guys have yeah. Right. Yeah. And I, so maybe one of the items here is and to create a subcommittee to look at permit streamlining and coming up with our you know best practice recommendations yeah. around that. It can be very short little yeah, yeah, it's gonna say it's like exactly. Two or three exactly our our ad hoc subcommittee. Um but I think the specific recommendation I'm hearing mm -hmm. for now is do the instant permit process for the water heater replacements that are in the same location. Yes. Yeah, that, so yeah, that would be, that, that's Tom's. Uh, one right, thing, uh, I think the subcommittee yeah. and possibly the EQC is clear on today. Okay. But just to make sure. Yeah, that would be, that would be wonderful. And, and, and it's free and it's ready and it's in, on the record now, as opposed to cheating and not doing it. Just to get to Rory's question, I think it's definitely, the subcommittee would define what streamlining means. I don't necessarily think it's, are you asking, you're not asking for a laundry list of new ideas necessarily. No, just like if, if the recommendation for the scope of work for 2025 to 2030 is streamline the permit process, I think right. it, it would be helpful to include a definition of uh, like what, that? what does that mean to the commission? Yeah. Um, so that we can evaluate that. Yeah. I mean, if we wanted to put something out there, I would say reduce it to a week or less. Like and and, and just one contact point. Yeah. One, one one contact point a week or less. That would be the idea. Yeah. And I don't even know if that's reasonable or not. But <laughs> But, but I think the two dimensions we're talking about is complexity, number of coordination is complexity yeah. and time to permit. Like those yeah. feel like the big two. Yeah. So my definition of a streamlined permitting process is one that allows the city to reach its goal. So look at, do an estimate of how many permits are going to be needed to transition to 95% of our buildings being electric over the next five years, what permitting process enables that? That's a good point. And to, I think, um, Brian Schmidt's point is if we streamline this, it's going to save the city money because people are more efficient in their time and they're not having to go back and forth and do all these, you know, inspections that might not be necessary in the plan checks that might not be necessary. 
So we need to be efficient on the city resources as well. Um, but I, I strongly endorse Chair Headley's idea of a subcommittee for this. Yeah. I think that yeah. could be very helpful to the city. Okay. But, but only to define what it means not to generate yeah. 50 new Okay, ideas. so to define success. But, you know, I think in doing that, they may come up with specific things to look at. Yeah. So, and then just as a point of clarification through the chair, is, is the the timing of this, this would be one of the recommendations as a scope of work item for 2025? Or work. if we need to do it sooner, we could create it tonight. How urgent is this? It seems kind of urgent to me. Okay, I'm just, if we're looking at the... Oh, maybe it's a, sec a different motion? That well, yeah, that too. But is the is the idea that this uh, the subcommittee, when would the subcommittee report back? Because then I'm just trying to think of the timing and when we're going to need to go to. Yeah. Because we. Uh, yeah. I, I, I think that this can be done in, in, within a month or. Is, 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 would that work for you? Your requirement? Yeah. Because it, what it needs is a few a few meetings. That, you know, yeah. And also we'll need staff time. So does that align with what you all need to get done as well? I I want to tentatively say yes. <laughs> Be bold. Here's, well, here's another thought. I just observed like this is a subcommittee recommending the formation of a subcommittee. Well, yeah, no. that's what that is. so that's what this is, right? So this is the EQC recommending creating a subcommittee. No, this is this is we're going to vote. Why did we decide to take that out of the motion? Like the yeah, yeah. Of a subcommittee. We can have multiple three, motions. Three different so. EQC, oh, I see. Okay, I thought this was part of the yeah. motion to no. adopt the subcommittee. Then they oh, okay, because I was just going to say like extend the subcommittee's work for another month and don't shut it down. Mm -hmm. Might be one way to do it. Oh, that, yeah, that could be. So I, okay, I, so I, that I, could be yeah, updating yeah, yeah. the yeah. scope of the building decarb subcommittee to ask them to yeah. come up with a definition. I was confused. Yeah. I, thought sub, I thought we were voting on what the subcommittee recommendation would be, which was the subcommittee was recommending another subcommittee, which felt convoluted. But I see what you're saying. Either way yeah. can be done. Yeah, yeah, because uh, typically the subcommittee, now that they've made their recommendations, they we would disband. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so we, I think we could keep the subcommittee alive and have you look and come back with another recommendation that might be easier. Yeah, some we be given some guidance about subcommittees could only last for a certain yeah. period of time. But yeah. it's, it's not lasting forever. This is a short this is a extension. Um, or, or the th same three people can actually do the next up. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I think our goal is to is to get it done by the next meeting. Yeah, give it to them. That, that's that's all. Yeah, that's, I think it's totally fine to create a new committee. Yeah, just be on this for, one. For, for, yeah, for club. Yeah. Okay. Disband. Right. So we are going to disband the building decrep subcommittee after we get this motion passed. We'll create a new subcommittee on permit streamlining. We're getting really good at this. We are this. deep in yeah. it. We have three motions. <laughs> yeah. for one and then we're going to recommend a scope of work. We are a proper commission at this point. We are so. Yes. <laughs> I went to school with Jesuits. Oh, nice. Yeah. How many I just got? Something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I need to remember to chart what the watch people at this way is. Uh, <laughs> okay. Didn't need to do that, Tony. Right. Just wind in. Maybe it's more than 20 years. So is this is this reflecting what we were talking about, the action to adopt the recommendations of the building, decarbonization ad hoc subcommittee, then a motion to dissolve, and then there was a third one to uh, create to create to create um a subcommittee, the permit streamlining ad hoc subcommittee. 
Um, and then I just think we need to take a closer look at the recommendations to make sure that yeah. all the essential pieces are there. Okay. I think in in it's looking pretty good, but I think we should just take another look. Because of some bills going to Yeah. Okay. So adopt the dual coverage approach, explore companion programs, streamline the permitting process. Do we want yeah, to update that one? Um, yeah. Well, I was just saying, do we want to update this point since we're creating the subcommittee? Like, yeah. Shall we delete that? Or, or actually, okay. So what I'm here, I'm thinking though, okay. if it's the 2025 to 2030, I think streamlining the permitting process is going to be a really important yeah. ongoing thing for staff to work on. So I would recommend keeping it in here. But it goes. I think were you going to say it goes under the other one now, like these. Four or five go under the first motion. The, the yeah, like maybe we, it would be added as, um, you know, when we when that subcommittee comes back with their recommendation, then we would add that to the like. Would we have time to add that in still for the 2030? Yeah, that, that was the important question that I was thinking about. I or yeah, or you can say like as defined by the. Oh yeah, no, that that would work. Okay, yeah. Are we okay deleting that? Okay, so, okay, great. <laughs> and so y'all can come back with the same day water heater situation. And then supporting PCE, uh, supporting the multifamily electrification. Yeah. And then the community dashboard. Okay. Can we get a little, uh, yeah. Uh, no. The <laughs> atmosphere togetherness is. Do you just want to delete that last time? <laughs> I think well, that's yeah, it's, I, I, well, I'm happy keeping it in as long as we can get crisper on measure. Yeah, well, we want to measure ga gas output. Plus, we want to cap. We want to put the community dashboard under Explore Companion Programs because that's where it was in the presentation. I think we were saying we want to. Well, yeah. I was thinking we wanted to hedge this because if the, if the true goal is the reach codes and everything is sort of optional, mm -hmm. then all the, the companion programs, then I don't feel really good about it because I think if the reach code pass, we have to show some art publisher, if, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the dashboard was a component of outreach, which is, in the subcommittee opinion, very important. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, if you want to elevate dashboard, then we could elevate outreach and dashboard if everybody was comfortable with that because I think that out, you, you're just making me think that for city council to feel eventually comfortable to pass the reach code, they're going to want to know what citizens think about it. So they're going to want the outreach to happen and they're probably going to want to I'm just trying to think of the ultimate, will we get the votes and outreach and measurement feel combined, you said, and they don't feel option. Yeah, so, um, okay. Can you make it a little bit smaller so we can see all of it together? Thank well, you. First we tell everyone. I know. <laughs> Maybe it's a create a, create a, a, a sorry, I can't even see where it was. Oh, the outreach. Did you say build community? You don't like that? Sure. Yeah, we can just delete the whole last part. It's create a community dashboard well, to measure and track progress and. Yeah, how about community, create community outreach plan and dash and measurement dashboard. Okay, it's so a community outreach plan and measurement dashboard. Yeah. And then maybe in sub uh sorry yeah. parentheses put uh something around you know gas plus electrification uh totals or something. Yeah, gas usage plus, plus electrification. It's I mean, counting. Um, I mean, it could be permits. Oh, yeah, I like that electrification progress. Great, vague, mm -hmm. and at some point I'll get more specific. 
Yeah, we can work out the details about that because okay. you know I'm not going to get on that so far. So, yeah, so absolutely. I think the do you know that actually, that's okay. I mean, that feels good enough that we're yeah. It feels good enough to me too. Okay, so um, does this go with the first motion? Let's see. Yeah. Well, the first motion. Is yeah. 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 The good. subcommittee recommendation. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's all. Do we to create the subcommittee first because it's not the. <laughs> wait, wait. We're going to adopt. We want to adopt their recommendations Which are the as modified yeah. below. So we take the, the one from the bottom, we'll glue it to the front. Yeah. Right? Yes. So, yeah. so take all of that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. 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 This is the ultimate backseat driving. All right. No, we're doing great. Yeah. So that's the first motion. There you go. In our atmosphere of togetherness, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it okay. So maybe we can take them one at a time. How yeah. about we? Um, I'm looking for a motion and a second on this this one. Anybody want to? How much? Uh, uh, motion or second? Okay. second. Okay. Okay. Yeah, let's let's okay. start so with the, the, oh, sure. yeah. Yeah. With the oh, what do we think? Oh, we have to create the subcommittee. Let's right, because it's referenced in the. Okay, so first we will create a subcommittee, an ad hoc subcommittee for permit streamlining. Um, I move that we create a subcommittee on this part. I start. Headley for a first, Kissel for the second. Do we put people on it? And is it well, well, let's create it first and we can put people oh. on it. <laughs> and is that bullet in the discrete time, amount of time um, to create? Um, yeah. To define as so we have down the layer, yeah. I was gonna say, can we just delete the space? For... <laughs> no. Define so it at all, yeah. But from streamlining, it's is... right below there, Rachel. Right? Yeah, it so is. Like, we just well, this was the... these were uh, some ideas. Oh, I see, yeah. Okay, because yeah. it just to define permit streamlining. How about to define yeah. permit streamlining goals? Mm. No, just permit. Uh, okay. there you go. Good, good enough. Oh, okay. great. Yeah. And, and return long. to the yeah. And return to uh the EQC with the recommendations no later than May 2023. Four. Last year, yes. Okay. 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 So, yeah. Does that work for you or are you? I, mean, I exhaled it uh hurriedly. Um <laughs> May first. Well, so when when is our next meeting? Yeah, yeah. we have to return to the meeting right? to the right. EQC meeting. So then the next meeting is April seventeenth. Yeah, so it's either April seventeenth. Okay, how about by May 30, 2024, just in yeah. case. So the next case. I mean, is that the, the meeting after? Yeah. yeah. Is that is that good enough for you? Or? So I, the the only consideration is that. It, the overall timeline. So if we're if we're looking at bringing something, like we, we would need to receive the recommendation on the permit streamlining definition, and then um, we need to work with the partners in community development to um, understand what it would take to implement that, and then evaluate the staff recommendation with that information, and then bring incorporate that into the overall. Plan. So it's it's not allowing too much time and, and might result in us needing to push when we go to city council because we're we're targeting July for the city council like cap scope of work update. So if it's possible to can 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 we deliver can can that group that subcommittee deliver a, an, an initial version in April and then a final version in May? Can that subcommittee deliver? Would that work for you? April okay. April would be better. Okay. Yeah, but April. then let's say April 30th of 2024. That means it's coming. We're going to discuss it at the next EQC meeting. Yeah. That means we need recommendations to staff in like two weeks. But it should be minor, right? Because I think if the question is yeah. like we just need to define because yeah. we already have two of them, speed to permit and yeah. complexity of interlocks or whatever we call. Yeah. Like okay. I, I mean I'm just this... thinking as long as the subcommittee, whoever's on it, yeah. can essentially do the work in two weeks and get stuff to Ori. Right. That's that's what it like by it, 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 it can be done. Uh, that's fine. That's fine. I I, I says, well, I think so. Because <laughs> I, I agree with you. This is not 
This is not rocket science. Yeah, yeah. Corey, are you with us? I'm I'm with you and I'm in the future on, on April 17th. Um, so we will have our regular uh, chair vice chair meeting and talk about the items on, on that. And, but I think I think if yeah, that can work. And it would need to be a, a short. Yeah, great. Okay, so can you call for a vote or on this one? Oh, sorry. Go, go for a Do we? Okay, so we, we have a motion and a second. Uh, yes, okay, so we have a motion and a second. Um, motion from Chair Headley and a second from Commissioner Kissel to create a permit streamlining ad hoc subcommittee to define permit streamlining and return to the EQC with recommendations no later than April 30th, 2024. Um, all, okay, um, so please. You raise your hand if you're voting in the affirmative. All commissioners have voted in the affirmative. The motion passes. I think the next thing we need to do is populate it with humans. Yes, we do. And it, we need to um, put like people a sign. On the oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Who would like to be on this subcommittee? We can have. Like to be. Okay. Who else? Who does support me? I would like to. Okay. So we have. I move that commissioners pull the radio part. Lynn and McKenna form the subcommittee. Who would like to second that? Okay. Thank you. Ship it. Exactly. All right. Can you call for a vote, Rory? Yes. So we have a motion and a second. Uh, motion from Chair Headley and a second from Commissioner Kissel uh, to appoint Commissioners Lynn, Pellegrino Yopart, and McKenna to the Permit Streamlining Ad Hoc Subcommittee. Thank you for real turn on it. <laughs> oh, yes. All, all in favor, please raise your hand. Um, let the record show that. Um, yes, all, all commissioners present will be in the affirmative and the motion passes. Wonderful. We are making so much progress. Okay, now scrolling back up to the top for this ad hoc subcommittee. Um, okay, so we've got dual coverage, companion programs, streamlined permitting, multifamily, and outreach and dashboard. Is there anyone who'd like to make a motion? Uh, sorry, uh, just to put the two things together. So, so this motion is forward looking, forwardly yeah. approving Can using the result that comes from the other side. Oh, with the permit streamlining? Yeah. Yes, it will also incorporate that. Yeah. So the third bullet down, permit streamlining okay. as defined by the permit streamlining ad hoc subcommittee. So this is kind of a future where we're, yeah. we're taking the output of the future and putting it in here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're kind of going back and forth. So we're saying we want to adopt the recommendation of the subcommittee That's for 2025 right. to 2030. And we want to also incorporate the specific future recommendations of the permit streamlining. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, and is that right? It, I, it's a bit kind of. I might suggest okay. that we, uh, when the permit streamline ad hoc subcommittee presents the recommendations, we make a motion then to incorporate their recommendations into. Oh, okay. So, so I think it'd be easier just to delete that. Yeah. 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 Okay. Great. I think so. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Because I don't want to guarantee, but I don't want right. to guarantee. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Does that work for you too? Okay. Um, all right. So we have a simplified motion that's ready for a, a motion, actually. We're ready for a motion in a second. Let's go for Oh, what do you see that? Let's go Do we, do we need to adopt the dual coverage approach? Maybe print C's, Knox plus, do we just need to spell it out a little bit more? Or not really. If, if I, I would, I would spell it out, just put in brands or something, just yeah. like the, the Knox and uh, the, energy. the margin, single margin. Yeah, yeah, zero Knox standard and single margin approach. Rachel, you're doing great. 
Okay. Okay. Can I um, just wanted to be clear that the dual coverage approach has the zero knock standard as the um, primary code and the single margin approach as the, the backup. Yeah. Are we done with the session? Because what I think I want to make sure I understood. I heard you say it and then I didn't really register is. So if the zero knocks passes, then there won't be the single market. We mm -hmm. Correct. We're gonna, yeah, well, we'll be passing both. Both will be I mean, what, what, what does it mean? To, what, what does it mean to pass? I mean, you need both of them because you never know when the first one is going to get impacted by a lawsuit. That's what so, I, so, so you need both of them. That's what I thought. Okay, so it's yeah. it's a both, if we can get a both. If we get the first one, great. Well, the, the proposal to the council yeah, yeah. is is put the put them both there because okay. it's it, it's a it's a it's a class, right? Is that yeah? yeah. Is the primary if in the future the the, 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 the noise yeah. goes down, then the, the other one activates. Yeah. So the strategy is to adopt. But we're assuming that this is legal. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Does that answer your question, Jeff? Sort of. Do we want to say adopt dual coverage approach? So we all know what that means, but like. Two months from now, we're going to know what that means. But, but, like, say something about passing both. I think like, that's what dual coverage means. Yeah. But are we going to remember well, that, like, two months? I think so. We've got yeah. Brian here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that's Brian and the other Brian. Yeah. I think the people who are deep in it will remember. Okay. And we have their power. Yeah, that's totally yeah. cool. Yeah. Yeah. But, the, yeah. The council is going to get the full call. Yeah. Okay. Very much. I move that we adopt these recommendations as amended. I'll second. Sounds good. So, Headley Kissel. <laughs> yes. Okay. Would you call for a vote? Yes, sir. Uh, so we have a motion and second motion by Chair Headley and a second by Commissioner Kissel to adopt the recommendations of the building decarbonization ad hoc subcommittee on the 2025 to 2030 scope of work for uh, cap strategy number one as modified to adopt the dual coverage reach code approach, which is zero NOx standard as primary code and single margin approach as backup to enhance building code, two, to explore companion programs for equity and impact. Um, support PCE development of multifamily electrification program or um, to explore establishing a turnkey multifamily electrification partner uh, as a city program. Or, sorry, I don't, I don't change that. Um, turnkey multifamily electrification partner and create community outreach plan and measurement dashboard gas usage and electrification progress to create an atmosphere of togetherness and track progress. We can take that atmosphere of togetherness. We, <laughs> we, we really can. It, I think yeah. we, it's up to them. So, so we're okay removing that? I'm okay that removing one. it. Yes, Are you okay I, I, I agree. Okay. okay, so I'll note that um, the motioner has agreed to a friendly amendment. And now the final bullet reads to create a create community outreach plan and measurement dashboard, including data points for gas usage and electrification progress to track progress. All uh, fine. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. Okay, so we'll now call for the vote. All commissioners in favor, please raise your hand. Okay, let the record show that um, all commissioners present voted in favor and the motion passes. And all right. Oh, then we have to mm -hmm. consult the subcommittee. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Do we need to have that as a separate motion? Mm -hmm. Okay. I move that we dissolve the ad build, building decarbonization ad hoc subcommittee. I second it. Okay. All in favor? All right. Well, my yeah. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting late. <laughs> All the subcommittee members. Yeah. I like we're done. All right, but let's we'll make sure Rachel has time to capture everything. Okay, motion passed. Great. Excellent. Okay. Um we have reports and announcements, so let's make them speedy. Um let's start with um staff. Do you all have any other updates for us? 
Yeah. 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 Uh, I was going to share about Arbor Day and the PCE member agency grants. Okay. Um, Arbor Day will be on Tuesday, April 9th at 9.30 a.m. at the Bellhaven Child Development Center. There will be three planting locations within the facility, um, and kids um, who go to the center will participate in the event. Um, and since kids are involved, it's not going to be a public event, um, but we did want to share that Arbor Day is happening and um, will be in partnership with our friends at the Bellhaven Child Development Center. And then the second um, update I wanted to share was about Peninsula Clean Energy's member agency grants, where the city of Menlo Park is eligible for about $786,000 um, for electrification and EV readiness type projects. Um, there is an application process, so the city has not received a, a big check from Peninsula Clean Energy. Rather, we need to um, develop a proposal and submit it through their online portal. Um, and we're working internally to identify where we may have gaps in funding for our capital improvement projects and um, community efforts, community engagement efforts. Um, so we'll share as we make progress towards applying for those, those um, funding opportunities. It's not a competitive um, grant or anything. So it, it's exciting. Mm -hmm. It's very exciting. Um, Thank you. Um, so just to build on that, we're we're looking to bring back um, the home electrification, Menlo Park home electrification program to the city council, which is um, a part, would be a partnership with Peninsula Clean Energy um, to spend the first half of the four point five million dollars that was awarded by the state. Um, so that's going to city council um, tentatively scheduled for April second on April sixteenth. We have a couple items that might be going. Um, one of them is the um, tentatively the PCE Gov PV, so that's the solar for public buildings, um, mm -hmm. and the power purchase agreements. And those came before the the commission um, previously. Uh, so again, that that's scheduled for April sixteenth. Um, we have the permit fee waiver update, which would be coming in April or May to the city council, um, bringing the recommendation from um, this evening. We have the Tesla pilot update that will be coming later in spring. The Earth Day event, April 13th on Saturday uh, at Bloom House in East Palo Alto. And that's the community uh, event in partnership with the city of East Palo Alto and a number of other uh, community groups. Um, and then we talked about the Arbor Day. We, uh, there's also a Spring, spring Fest, um, which will have an induction cooking demo. And so um, please take a look at the, the city's calendar. Uh, citywide calendar for uh, for all the events and and um, subscribe to the digest if you're not already uh, to track some of those exciting springtime events and share them with uh, folks in your network and then related to cap five we're uh, we have a, the some exciting progress on the Bellhaven child development center electrification plan mm -hmm. uh, so we're working on the the RP for that um, and then for EV charging uh, we were tentatively approved for upside switch gear, and so we're expanding that uh, fleet charging project to, to maximize our, our make ready infrastructure. Um, and our fleet supervisor, Don Weber, and his team were able to submit our um, vehicle information to comply with the first uh, requirements of the state advanced clean fleets requirements. I think that's it. I, I did just want to um, say thank you to uh, Liz Tapia, who's the other management analyst in sustainability, uh, who did the, the majority of the work on the, the fee waiver presentation uh, that we gave this evening and, and um, yeah, has been supporting a lot in the background, um, including work on the uh, urban forest plan. And, and I think uh, maybe the others will provide an update on, on that. Well, thank you, um, all of you. Rachel, Ori, and Liz for everything you've been doing. I know it's been a lot, and I'm really proud of everything we're doing. All right, so updates from commissioners. Yeah, John. Yeah, so yesterday the city council and EQC received an email with handwritten letters from Oak Hill School. Uh, I wanted to personally thank fourth grade teacher Mrs. Ward, Miss Ward, and her students, Akari, Jordan, Emilia, Cameron, Matilda, Quinn, Alessandra, Layla, Rose, Carter, Owen, Jake, Emily, Kazma, Kate, Malhar, Susie, Mark, Brody, and two anonymous students for writing and sending these letters. Um, 
They spoke about their concern for wasted energy use, lack of air conditioning on hot days in August, September, and October in their classrooms that affects their ability to learn, deforestation, too many cars on the road, wildfires, food waste, and school lunch packages in single-use plastics. Mm -hmm. uh, my daughter's a fourth grader, so your letters have extra meaning for me. I wanted to say to Ms. Ward and her students that we hear you. We are all volunteering our time to address these very concerns and to do what we can to create a better future for you. Your voices are powerful and we appreciate you. I also want to let you know that your school district is aware of these concerns too, and they are working with Menlo Spark and others on plans for the installation of solar panels and air conditioning to create a better learning environment for you and your fellow students. Thank you. Yeah, those letters were so touching. Thank you. Yeah. Um, is there an update from the adaptation subcommittee or maybe about the urban forest plan or anything else? Um, yeah, I can, uh, two quick things. So thanks for everybody's time. Uh, last month on the urban forest management plan uh so i went back and looked at what i was telling but he kept saying we're waiting for cal fire we're waiting we're waiting the good news is cal fires now issued the guidelines for uh that mm -hmm. there are a number of different tracks but the city can ask for up to 1.5 million dollars um i don't think we'll potentially ask for that full amount because um those are for much larger projects than what we're looking at but it just goes to show that when the city puts money in the budget and the teams work together, uh, I we have a pretty good shot at that. So Cal Fire, uh, we're going to talk about it tomorrow. Um, and then Cap 6, I think we've got a draft out there and we'll be sharing it soon. I think in April 8th is our deadline, if I remember right. So uh, yeah, the subcommittee is hard at work and we'll, we'll have that on the April meeting. Great. Okay, so with that, uh, quick quick update. Just um, the PC board of directors is next week. Uh, you, if you are interested, one of the topics is probably going to be discussed is their new rates uh, to structure. Uh, PC has traditionally uh, under cut uh, the PG generation rates for, by five percent. They are reshuffling the whole thing, so there there are different approaches about how to. How, how to address the problem. Right? So there are different takes. So if you're interested, I, I went to the, I, I listened to the executive director, executive committee discussion. It was very, very interesting. I think it's worth, worth, worth trying to tell. All right. Okay. Well, thank you all for hanging out in here we at 9.57 and the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Right, gavel. Ching -ching. These two gavel. <laughs> oh my god, well, this will be a little bit of a second of the infant. It's the deadly pistol, which I'm going to ball. It's a great one.